Um, thank you. Uh, my co-chair, Mr. Hucker, and I have talked, and I'll chair the meeting. Um, and so, first of all, just as a you know starting point, text me, council members, text me. Um, there may be moments when we would have a more free-flowing discussion, and, and, and we don't need to use that, but I haven't done this yet with a joint committee. It feels a little bit closer to the full council, so it may be necessary to just do the, the texting cue. Um, so let me know when you'd like to speak. And if I somehow miss you, uh, you know, it's just let me know. Um, you can raise your hand. No, you missed me. Um, and now we'll begin. I want to start. Uh, I will offer the councilors a chance to make any comments that they'd like to make as an introduction or, or a preface. Um, I would like to share a few thoughts myself. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my co-chair uh, of the Joint Committee and co-lead sponsor, Tom Hucker. Um, you know, Tom has been a champion on the environment for his entire career in public service, and uh, it was a real lift when uh, Tom joined in supporting this. And um, you, know, you bring the unimpeachable background to this discussion and uh, you know, a record of making a lot of tough decisions. And so I just want to thank you for your leadership and for coming in on something that I know isn't necessarily the easiest uh, proposal. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Sierra Club. Um, this, this is a tough issue. This is a divisive issue. I, I acknowledge that. It's not an easy one. This is one where, you know, our own family is split. Um, and the Sierra Club's steadfast leadership on this issue and on other issues where the environmental community, I think, at times can be divided. Uh, it, it just, without the Sierra Club, I don't know where we'd be on this issue and on, and on many other issues because, uh, you know, you have to sort through, um, you know, a lot of difficult questions and you have to be willing to take a stand on, on getting things done that really matter and, and, and what local government can really do. And the Sierra Club's advocacy on this has been essential. Uh, so I just want to recognize and thank the Sierra Club, among the many organizations that are participating, uh, but I just really want to thank the Sierra Club and the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, the CCAN is strongly supporting the, the zoning change. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll say with Sierra Club and CCAN on board, you know, I think it's a very strong statement about the urgency of this proposal and the, um, you know, it's, it's strong basis in policy and um, the need for us to, to take action. Um, generally, I view this as a, a matter of taking action as opposed to talking about taking action or studying taking action. You know, we have the power to do something right now that will produce a very measurable impact on emissions, that will reduce our reliance upon fossil fuels in our grid. And there is absolutely nothing more important for us to do than green our electric grid. The grid is the source of energy for our buildings, which consume 40, 45% of all our electricity in the county. The grid is the source for our electric vehicles. And that is something we hope to grow in the future, whether electric buses or electric cars. So if we have a clean grid and we are able to reduce demand for energy through clean building reforms, switch fossil fuel vehicles to plug in electric vehicles, we can actually get emissions under control. It is possible for us to succeed in our fight against emissions and the climate change devastation that our dependence upon emissions is causing. And we can do it at the local level, but all these things have to work together. And any way that we can help grid, green the grid, uh, I, I think we have to take action to do that. And so underlying this whole discussion is a big picture strategy, which is Montgomery County taking leadership to support transforming our entire electrical grid so that it has clean, renewable sources of energy rather than fossil fuel energy and uh, making the tough decisions to, to lead in the state to do that. Uh, there, there is an underlying issue here of ownership of solutions. Uh, you know, I, I regret that the recommendation from the 
working group appears to be that large scale solutions are someone else's problem. Uh, you know, that must not have to meet its own energy needs locally. That that's impossible and therefore we shouldn't really try too hard. And I know some will object to that, but to me that's a very fair and clear reading of the decisions that they have recommended. And I don't agree with that. I just won't, I can't agree with that. I think we have to do everything we can. I acknowledge that we may or may not be, I don't know if we'll be able to um, actually provide our local consumption with locally generated clean renewable power. I don't know if we can provide it all, but I know we can provide a lot more. And I think if every community does everything it can, then I think we have a chance to solve this, this problem. So I, I think we have to own it. I think it's a, a duty and obligation, and I think it's an opportunity. And I think we are leading on an issue that is absolutely essential, which there is a very difficult debate underlying this. And we're gonna get into a lot of specific issues. And I, I'll say to my colleagues, I'll give everyone a chance to make any comment at the beginning of this. And I acknowledge I'm a sponsor of the CTA. I, I know where I'm coming from, and everybody knows where I'm coming from. Uh, there is a very difficult issue here, which is the future of solar and the future of farming. And we are trying to do everything we can to bring them together. But climate experts, everyone who has looked at this in a serious way, who has said, what is it going to take to transform the grid to clean renewable, has said that there is absolutely no way to do it without using some land that is now used for agriculture and using it for solar. There is no way to do it without that. And I think to me, it all the, the, the pivot point is whether you would accept that or not. If you don't accept it, then this CTA doesn't seem like it's all that needed. But if you do accept it, then I think you have to say, we've got to do our part. And just because we zoned a third of our county in a very restrictive manner does not mean that there isn't some room for us to shoulder for some of the burden, to contribute to the solution, and to make a difference. So what I have proposed, what we have proposed in this zoning text amendment has a cap. You know, we looked at a lot of ways to balance the need to preserve our agricultural use and everything that that embodies with allowing this specific targeted use. And there's a lot of different ways that you could limit it. You could limit it by soil. You could limit it by, you know, slope. You can limit it by any number of different ways. But a lot of those options leave you in the end with nothing workable. The folks who are recommending that may be their intent, but it's not my intent. And I want that what we allow is used. And so what we've recommended in this zoning text amendment is 1800 acre cap. 1800 acres can be used out of 90,000 in the agricultural reserve. I think that that is a meaningful number that will provide a real contribution to fighting climate change, but it does not in any way tip the balance or fundamentally change or threaten the agricultural reserve as a policy, as, a, as you know, which is part of our tradition. So I, I want to acknowledge that I understand, I think we all do, that there is a difficult issue here where the rubber meets the road about the use of this land and, and our farmers. Uh, the way I think about it is very simple. If, if you farm wheat or soy or corn or anything turf, this is less land that will be farmed in that manner. So if your business is selling tractors, this is 1,800 acres less of land that needs a tractor. Uh, this is 1,800 acres less of land that will be planted with wheat. And maybe you sell wheat or you are part of that supply chain. So I acknowledge that this is not pain-free for um, those who engage are engaged in those agricultural practices. Uh, I also think that there are many farmers at, for whom this is an advantage. This is a way to support their enterprise, to carve off a small piece of land within their own operation, generate additional income, and maybe would support more table food production rather than commodity production. Our ag reserve is largely focused on commodity production. It's for the meat supply chain. Now, don't people realize that? 
is for the meat supply chain. Chickens, it's cows. Um, that is not necessarily an environmentally sound land use. If the Ag Reserve is about preserving heritage and culture and a way of life. It is not a conservation strategy that is essentially about the environment. It's about the people who live there. And it's about Montgomery County always being a home to people who want to embrace that, that life. And I think that's why it's an appropriate policy for us to use a small acreage, because what this is trying to do is preserve a way of life for all of us. Whatever lifestyle we have, we are dependent upon solving the climate crisis. And we all have to do our part. We all have to contribute. And I wanna to say to the farmers, the rest of the county has to do its share. I've heard you, I agree. We need to max out rooftops. We need to max out parking lots. We need to do all that. But I think this is a reasonable proposal for us to allow a targeted use in the Ag Reserve to sustain our ways of life, to meet the challenge of climate change as best we can. So uh, with that, I'd like to turn it to my co-chair. If you'd like to make any comments, and I have um, council members uh, Rice and Juwando uh, teed up, and uh, I want to mention, uh, I mentioned the Sierra Club, Al Bartlett is here. Uh, as a resource for us, as is uh, Leslie Eider from the um, solar companies. We have the ag community, J Jeremy Chris. We have we have many people here to participate. So uh, I will now pass to Mr. Hucker to, as he wishes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, your comments are making me furiously uh, edit what I was going to say. Um, this very very uh, good thoughtful analysis. Um, I, I too want to add um, you, my thanks to you for all your leadership on this um, difficult issue. I know you've put a lot of time and thought into it um, and appreciate everything you said about me and appreciate the support of the CR Club and CCAN and so many of the advocates that we heard at the public hearing that seems like it was a year ago. Um, this is a significant bill. Um, we know it's going to provide enough energy uh, if passed to power 54,000 homes, that's, that's, a, that's a big piece of legislation. That's terrific. Um, and, and the potential is even you know, greater than that, and the need is greater than that. Um, I, I just want to piggyback on what you said about greening the grid. Um, it's, I think it's hardly ever mentioned, um, but worth mentioning, that we have the energy industries that we have now including a very vigorous fossil fuel industry um, in, in, in multiple sectors through decades, in some cases, hundreds of years of tax subsidies um, by the federal government in particular, um, whether we're talking about um, our oil leases or natural gas or anything else. Um, that's money that's come out of all of our pockets for years, and we've paid more than the market would have ordinarily allowed um, to stand up those industries and Defenders of those industries would say uh, that created a, a robust economy and, and many and, and millions of jobs and, and other things um, that that are very have been very beneficial to the country. Um, standing up renewable energy industries requires the same sort of attention, um, and in many cases that involves subsidies as well. I spent four years uh, on my own at the beginning with Senator Pinsky and, and for several years with Governor O'Malley getting the offshore wind legislation passed that's now finally going to start producing, um, we hope, some uh, just dramatic um, growth in renewable energy off the coast of Maryland. Um, at the time, people criticized that uh, by saying, well, this is going to drive up the cost. Uh, this is going to make energy companies charge us more for electricity um, and pay more for a less efficient, um, meaning less subsidized by other uh, sources. Uh, area of energy, but that's the cost of getting a new in, uh, industry off the ground. Um, that's not even what we're doing here. We need a vigorous solar industry working in all different areas. Um, and uh, I was I was uh, proud to have all your support passing the original community solar ZTA uh, in Montgomery County um, that left out the Ag Reserve. Um, and I'm very happy that uh, Councilmember Rice, who supported that bill, 
is now on this bill to expand it. That's terrific, and I think it's exactly what we need to do. But this bill, unlike many other bills to build up our a viable, profitable, renewable energy industry and green the grid, um, doesn't cost anyone anything, doesn't restrict anyone's rights. It only removes restrictions on some property owners' rights. Um, and yes, there's no question, as people, some of the opponents said at the hearing, we need to do everything we can to get solar arrays on rooftops, um, commercial and residential, on garages, on open fields, in many other areas of the county, absolutely. Um, this is not in opposition to that goal. It's we need to do both and. Um, and it is certainly, I think we can all stipulate, um, given that we declared a climate emergency unanimously, the last council, and we've adopted very ambitious climate goals to drop our carbon emissions 80% by 2027, that's around the corner, 100% by 2035. There's no way to get there without passing this bill and other bills that some people will view as inconvenient. And we could go another path and just say, well, we're, we're not ambitious enough to do that, but I think if, if, if folks have concerns about this bill, fundamental philosophical concerns, we, you know, we should state that and, and give up on those goals because we have those goals out there as public commitments that we've all held hands and, and agreed to. Um, um, so yes, getting, you know, getting this off the ground because it's co commercially viable um, only makes uh, what some opponents said, said they were uh, they believe needs to be done in other areas of the county, it only makes it more commercially viable. So, um, you know, I believe in both and, I need, know we need to do everything and respond to this emergency appropriately. And again, it uh, brings me back to being grateful for your leadership, Hans, and everybody who's, uh, who's supporting this. But I think uh, we need to do this and go farther. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Jawando, followed by Councilmember Rice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to my colleagues. Uh, this is an important discussion. Uh, one of one of I feel like this day to, is to use Councilmember Rice is, is a chock full of important discussions. We've been straight through all all day today. Um, we absolutely, uh, I'm going to start here. Absolutely need more solar and more renewable energy, um, and it needs to be generated within Montgomery County for use by Montgomery County residents. I think that's an important point. So yes, we must uh, green the grid uh, and uh, creating this type of renewable energy uh, is critical and essential to meeting our climate goals. I agree a, a thousand percent uh, with those statements uh, and that we need to figure out ways to do that. Um, I wanna start there. Uh, I also believe that our agricultural reserve uh, is a national model. Uh, for preserving land for agriculture uh, and is critical for ensuring that we have locally sourced food uh, as well as many other things. Uh, given that, uh, it's essential that we ensure the viability of the agricultural reserve and protect uh, that purpose. Um, and we know, look, we're have not having this context, this conversation out of context or in a vacuum. Uh, there has been a history of uh, attempts to change the purpose uh, of the Ag Reserve and, you know, for uh, reasons that I don't uh, belial anyone's intentions, but that, that has happened. And so you understand why uh, people are a little antsy and concerned when you talk about changing the, the function and form and purpose of a particular parcel of land that was put out for, per, for, for specific purposes, uh, namely for farming and production. Um, and so we have to understand that. And so, uh, but also, uh, you know, we have to look at the specifics here. So stating those two things, you know, one of the things I'm weighing as I consider, you know, where I will be ultimately on this uh, proposal, uh, it's gonna I think in large part for me determine, depend, depend on as we move through the various issues and have the, the discussion. Uh, there's nothing in the CTA, for example, to stop a producer from building a solar farm uh, and using the energy for sale in another jurisdiction. Uh, that's something that I think is something that we need to look at. Um, 
it should be for community solar. It should be for county residents to meet our goals if, if we proceed in any form or fashion. Um, I think it also should be done in a way that helps pr farmers produce locally sourced food and, and is supportive of that mission uh, and, and not uh, get in the way or inhibit that in any way. Uh, and that's going to lead us to discussions of soil type and how percentages of land I think we're going to, you know, we need to have all those discussions. And so uh, I'm glad we're taking our time and going to consider this over several sessions. Um, I wanted to state, you know, from the general premise, I don't know. It, we'll see how this shakes out. It's a joint committee, and then we'll obviously go to full council. I, I think we actually have six council members participating, participating today. Um, or, or, you know, five. Well, council member Rice, uh, and that's six? Yeah, that's six. Okay, I, I got my math right. Not voting, Zeph, you're right about that, but participating. Um, so we have to just go through those issues. But I just wanted to state up front and not hide the ball. That's the way I like to operate. Uh, I'd like to see uh, a way that we can do this. I will say there is the question of sequencing. It's been mentioned a couple of times by my colleagues that there are uh, opportunities and in, in by uh, advocates for not proceeding with this bill, this ETA, that we should produce solar on existing uh, buildings and rooftops and the like throughout the county. And I think that if I saw some number, and Jeff will correct me if I'm wrong, there were 30,000 or so, uh, you know, op square foot opportunities to do that. Uh, he's nodding in the county. And, and there's a question of sh sequencing. And if it maybe it costs a little more to do so of that in some areas, sh should we do that first? Should we, how should we move forward? I think those are all valid questions that we'll talk about today. Um, and then the final thing I want to say is I want to have enough information. Uh, as I'm preparing for this hearing, and I've asked some very basic questions about uh, the soil composition and, and the GIS information of, you know, uh, grade one soil, uh, for example, and other things, I want to have some definitive answers of how we move forward uh, and have that information before I make my decision. I think those details matter. Uh, and I don't, right now, as of today, good thing is we're not voting today. I don't feel I have all those answers. So uh, that's kind of where I am right now. Uh, we have to we have to move forward uh, to protect our environment. Uh, but there's there's a lot of details here uh, that I look forward to going through with my colleagues. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to make those comments. Thank you, Councilmember Friedson, followed by Councilmember Rice. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll I'll be brief because I really do want to get into the depth of this issue. I just. First, I want to acknowledge that this is a very substantive, very serious, very important conversation that we're having. There are a lot of uh, important issues, important stakeholders. The integrity and importance of the Agricultural Reserve, what I consider to be one of the most important land conservation decisions, not just in Montgomery County, but anywhere uh, in the country, uh, and the need to safeguard and protect that, make sure that it is viable, uh, and make sure that it is safeguarded and the need to meet our ambitious climate goals that we can't meet alone without uh, making uh, the appropriate uh, changes uh, and without making significant uh, decisions. The status quo when it comes to our climate is not going to allow us to come close to meeting the goals that we need. And I've spent a lot of time over the last several months, uh, albeit that we were interrupted there a little bit uh, with some uh, conversations on hold between before the COVID crisis and uh, leading up to this uh, current discussion, uh, but uh, you know, I really have appreciated a lot of the conversations with stakeholders that have various different positions, some nuanced and some uh, on, on completely opposite sides uh, of this uh, particular ZTA. I think all have valid uh, views and, and I've really taken all of those to heart. I'm still weighing a lot of the different uh, intricacies of this uh, important conversation. I really do appreciate and just wanted to commend uh, the co-chairs for allowing for multiple discussions already scheduled to have the type of detailed, comprehensive conversation that something with this level of seriousness deserves. And I appreciate the fact that today uh, we're not voting, we're going to be listening, we're going to be learning, we're going to be providing the public with an understanding of the, uh, the specifics of this particular proposal and what its, impact, what its impacts are, and also have provided a forum for many of the different relevant uh, stakeholders from the uh, solar side and, and, and the farming side and the agricultural reserve 
uh, to be able to uh, weigh in and provide us with their perspective and uh, with their expertise. And so I just really appreciate that. And also wanted to uh, just acknowledge uh, Mr. Zions uh, on staff who's really been helpful for me, a tremendous resource uh, personally uh, and to my uh, team as we work through a very complicated uh, issue with uh, nuances that I uh, have never thought about uh, up until we started weighing uh, this issue. And so I just wanted to uh, first start uh, with, with that. I ask a lot of questions. My team uh, asks a lot of questions and uh, you have been uh, a great resource uh, for us in order to uh, to answer them and to weigh this issue. And so I just wanted to thank you for that. Absolutely. I was going to compliment Mr. Zions when it was his turn to get started on the pack. Uh, it's a great pack. Um, okay, Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you, Chair Reamer. Uh, I'll, I'll be quick uh, and, and basically say that in speaking with residents, farmers, and activists about this zoning text amendment, it's it's clear that we all want a greener, cleaner Montgomery County, and that is the basis of this conversation. Uh, and so uh, I have a lot of questions as well. Uh, this is a very complex issue, uh, and I'd like to start the conversation. So I know Councilmember Rice has something to say, and then uh, I look forward to taking a deep dive. So thank you. Great. Mr. Rice. Now that you teed it up that way, Evan, you make me have to be very expedient in terms of my statement. Um, <laughs> let me just say this. Um, I was a co-sponsor of this bill because I think that in the spirit of what we're trying to do, there's no question. As, as you heard from Councilmember Hucker and from Councilmember Reamer, when it comes to solar, there is no question. We need to do more. We need to do it in as many places as possible. There is no question about that. That needs to be a component of what it is that we're trying to do when it comes to green energy uh, and really turning back the effects of climate change throughout uh, our world, not just here in this region. But that being said, we also have to balance some of the needs that are there in our community. And one of the things I will just say that I heard from Councilmember Reamer that is actually changing is that, yes, in fact, uh, we have had a long history of having commodity crops here in the agricultural reserve. But I will say hundreds, if not thousands of acres have been converted from commodities crops to table crops to uh, supporting wineries and breweries in terms of growing hops and other kinds of things. Um, there's been a marked shift and there's even more potential. Council Member Juwando and I, and I can't remember whether it was January or February, attended a meeting out at the agricultural reserve park where uh, we, we were meeting with the Food Council and MCPS. Never has MCPS had an open conversation with our agricultural food producers about the possibility of doing business with them. That has now changed. That is huge for us because that actually gives the potential for a, a sustained market for folks to actually grow and start moving forward with table crops. And so the dynamic has changed. And so I want us to be sure we're not limiting those kinds of options for folks and make sure that there's a balance, right? There definitely needs to be a greening of our energy uh, here in this county and across the world. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to talk about food sustainability. And I will tell you that I'm chair of the Ag uh, Task Force for the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. And this is exactly what we're talking about now and about food insecurity and really talking about what it is that we need to do to continue to grow uh, more crops here to help sustain our region. And so from that perspective, there's a balancing act and I'm just not sure where that is. So I appreciate everyone who said that we wanna have a dialogue and conversation around this because I think that that's important. And we do have to acknowledge the evolution of our agricultural reserve as well. As I now live in it, uh, and across from one of our great wineries, I get to see uh, what that evolution entails and how it really is making a difference. And so from that perspective, I look forward to the conversation and thank you for your deference in allowing me to join you guys today. And thank you for co-sponsoring this CTA. Uh, really was very welcome when you joined, appreciate that. <clears throat> All right, so what we're going to do now is we're gonna go through the packet and uh, as I promised, Jeff, you did a terrific job on his packet. Uh, really lays out a lot of issues. I thought your summary of testimony was excellent and so on. So I think we can pretty much walk through the packet um, and probably won't need a ton of discussion, um, but it, certainly the floor will be open if someone wants to 
you know, engage. It's 2.15 now. You know, I think we can get through this packet today. Um, we are not voting today. We are going to be surfacing issues. You know, if, if there's something, if you want to express a point of view on a particular one, go for it. Uh, but we, the plan was, let's get everything out on the table. Hopefully we can get all the way through the packet and then we'll come next week, uh, not next week, but next meeting, I think it's two weeks, uh, you know, kind of prepared with amendments. We could, you know, those who want to request amendments or propose them, ideally they would be in the packet or the next committee meeting um, you know, it's always a goal, it doesn't always happen, but, uh, so, um, with no further ado, Jeff, uh, why don't you take us through it? Thank you. Thank you. The, the first thing I have to do is acknowledge that we're meeting on July 9th. If we were all in Rockville in 1864, uh, we would be hiding our cows, our horses, our liquor, and our money because the Confederates are attacking from the North. Uh, on, this, on this day in, in the, excuse me? Jubal Early, General Jubal Early was. Jubal Early was attacking. He was attacking the important point that, that Lou Wallace was defending with 7,000 troops, of, of which 1,300 died in the battle. They're now buried in Oliver uh, Cemetery, just south of Frederick. Uh, but Wallace was routed from the field, uh, he would say retreat, he was routed from the field, and, and he thought he had a defeat on his hands. Instead, he ended up being the savior of Washington by giving enough time for federal troops to get up here. Uh, so whatever you think is a failure, history might tell you wrong. Uh, that's my, my political message for the day. Uh, in any event, I'm very much- Chairman Reamer, that's a great message for Chairman Reamer today. <laughs> Uh, I am very much assisted in my packet and the presentation today by uh, Mira Singo, uh, a Council Summer Fellow. She uh, is attending uh, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill with a dual master degree uh, in, uh, for public administration and city planning uh, and a concentration in uh, Public management and housing policy. Or she, for three hour, for three years, she was a Peace Corps volunteer in Seagal, Senegal, West uh, Africa, working in sustainable agriculture. So she has been a real help to me. Um, for the thousands uh, watching at home, uh, there there are a number of participants that can be called upon. Uh, uh, the uh, chair mentioned this, but. Uh, we have uh, Robert Cronenberg, uh, Rich Weaver, Greg Russ, um, Chris McGovern, Andrea Hochberg from the executive, Stan Edwards executive, uh, Sarah Ramirez, uh, Jeremy Chris, and Mike Sheffield uh, among staff. So just so people know that, that they are, are here. Uh, this ZTA, uh, again, for the thousands in, in the uh, audience are it is basically Mill allowing, millions, Jeff. Millions, millions. Oh, million. Yeah. It's I actually, thought it was. A, I thought you only got millions on a Tuesday. Uh, the ratings go down on Thursdays, guys. So you got to know. Not for this they, topic, uh, Jeff. I got news for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Never mind. <laughs> no, no, the world is burning here. Let's go. All right. All right. Right. Um. Uh, this CTA would allow uh, a um, solar facility less than uh, uh, two megawatts uh, as a, an allowed use with conditions in the Ag Reserve up to 1,800 acres of it. Um, uh, there are conditions on that allowance uh, in that it would have to have site plan approval, which is a significant uh, look into its compatibility and it would have to have uh, solar, uh, well, shade friendly plants under it. So it would be, never be completely out of agriculture. And we'll talk about uh, adding to that or not, but, but it would certainly be bee friendly and, and, uh, and grazing friendly. And, and we hope maybe more than that as well. Um, currently, uh, for for facilities over two megawatts, uh, 
that get approval through the PSC, zoning law does not apply. We're actually preempted in those larger facilities as determined by the Court of Appeals. So if someone wanted to do a larger facility, they actually can as of right without regard to zoning. Hans, did you have anything? Councilman Reamer? No, sorry. That's just my notifications going off. I can't figure out how to turn them off. So please keep going. All right. We would try to keep track of how those takedowns on 1,800 acres would work, and the council would be notified. The significance of the under 2 megawatt criteria is that it's a candidate for the net metering program in Maryland, and that means that you can produce energy in excess of your needs for sure, but you could sell it back to the utility commission for the retail price as opposed to selling it back at the wholesale price. And that's a significant benefit toward doing solar. It makes solar much more cost effective that way. So this would take care of that program. The public hearing does seem so long ago. It was on March 3rd. It was actually different. Let me stop you there. I think you were just describing the community solar program itself, right, where you can accumulate and sell directly to the consumer, right? Yes, but 2 megawatts is the max. It must be under 2 megawatts. It's not just community solar that has that allowance. It's aggregated solar for individuals. So there's two components to what you call community solar. We'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. The public hearing was a nighttime meeting. I have all three inches of testimony at home with me. It included a book on regenerative agriculture. But to a little bit, it has been overtaken by new facts. The executive at first in testimony said the ZTA was premature, that at least they wanted to wait for the Climate Action Committee's report, and that the council should not consider it now. Just yesterday, he submitted new testimony that said he supports the ZTA with a various set of conditions. A number of those are parallel to the planning board's recommendations. However, he would also not allow solar on what's considered prime soils. That's being categories 1, 2, and 3 of agricultural ratings. So that is something very new, and I'm sure we'll get into that as we can get into more detail. He also mentioned things about retaining it as an accessory use. I have some legal problems with that, and we can talk about that later as we get into the discussion. The planning board recommended approval with some other changes as well. They would discourage solar on prime soils. They would prohibit solar on slopes 15% or greater. 15% is an interesting number. If you have more than 15% slopes within a stream valley, the environmental guidelines would call for more than 100-foot buffer area. So 15% is a significant number in how planning board sees the world anyhow. The planning board will also want to expand the crops available to be listed under solar. Interestingly enough, they would 
prohibit solar on soils that seasonally flood, which, which is interesting to me because the planning board has a site plan authority as, as the CTA was introduced. Uh, so uh, I, I think the planning board normally would keep things off of sensitive areas as it was, but, but they specifically required that. They uh, recommended deleting the fencing requirement, which is, uh, which we'll talk about later, and uh, somewhat protecting scenic views through the site plan review itself. And we'll see more about uh, protecting views as one of the details. Um, in broad brush, the testimony, um, uh, half a lot of the testimony said uh, it's premature, that. Uh, uh, the council should wait for the climate action plan. It should wait for the the general plan update, um, uh, and it should not go forward now. Uh, and of course, with that, the, there are some calls for other um, conditions that would make it more difficult. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are people who 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 sided with the idea that it's urgently needed, that for the sake of climate change, for the sake of meeting the council's own energy needs, we need to do it right now. And then in the middle, you've got a lot of people who just called for amendments, all of which we'll go through in real detail. Now, should the, should the council postpone? Um, that's always a, a issue that's asked in any zoning text amendment. There's always a reason not to do something, but uh, the council is the one that, that creates the um, impetus for things to go forward. Of, of course, the novel reason not to go forward is because we're in this environment where we can't meet face to face. Where, where the public doesn't feel like they have physical access to people. And, and uh, this is sort of a uh, insufficient due process that they feel. Well, in fact, on this one, we, we had a face-to-face -face meeting. Now that might not occur in the future with other ones, but we certainly met in face-to-face. -face. And as uh, procedurally so far as I know, there's no interruption of how the public can participate in this. Uh, they can listen on uh, on the web. They can listen on TV. They can they can actually call in if they don't have uh, either of those resources. They can, they are free to lobby the council members as they are with any piece of legislation. Um, so I don't know that's that. That's one, Jeff, because it's an important point. I mean. There is really no reduction at all in public participation. If anything, it's easier now because the expectation is you can do it from home. Uh, oh. That's per perfectly fine. Um, so in our committee sessions like this, I think there is a little bit of a confusion on this point. Sometimes people think that when we have a committee session that we have like an open mic portion where anybody who had something to say would be able to come up and say it. That's what our public hearing is. You know, we have a public hearing process, and we've already conducted that. Our online public hearings are also quite good. You're getting a lot of participation from people, um, so I don't think we're experiencing any reduction of public participation as a result of shifting to online participation. And you know, the notion that we would not proceed with legislative business just because we had to shift some online, so, you know, we couldn't do anything. Like we're working on police reform right now. We'd have to show that, you know, we have to say, well, we'll get to that urgent issue after, you know, we all return to in-person meetings. That, that's that's not acceptable. We, we would never, we couldn't do that. And I think climate is no more urgent or less urgent a crisis we need to be able to handle it now. So I know that there are some who, you know, have expressed dissatisfaction, but I can certainly attest from my perspective, there's not a distinction in the level of public participation, and if any, it's greater because now it's clear that online engagement is, is encouraged. So, thank you. Please continue. Yeah, I, I think it must be that some people think they're 
physical handshake is more persuasive than their thoughts. Well, we won't be doing those anywhere, anywhere, anyway. So you know. <laughs> that's what I mean. <laughs> so, so I just, you know, I, I got that in, in testimony. So I just wanted to address it. Um, so uh, the climate action uh, yeah. report is something that Adrian Hopper, I, I better get that name right. Uh, Adrian Hopper. Hopper is, uh, is, is doing, uh, uh, it will be out about next year, I think is uh, early 2021. Um, uh, the, the committee did preliminary put out uh, 850 strategies, uh, um, and I thought those strategies were uh, sort of open to the interpretation that that they would talk more about the Ag Reserve and, and maybe consider it. Um, uh, David Blockenstein thought I overreached on exactly what the um, the committee was saying. Uh, he would he would point out, uh, in fact, that. Uh, uh, that they were, they really wanted to um, study more and to uh, uh, to assess and rank uh, places rather than uh, being uh, generally open to it. Essentially, they wanted more study as as, as their study is continuing. So I, I didn't mean to over rank what what they have already said, but. Um, they had statements in their 850 uh, recommendations that, that addressed uh, the, the Ag Preserve with, um, you know, future evaluation of, of putting it there. They didn't say never or, or things like that. Well, okay, I met with them and I'm gonna turn, Mr. Glass has a question on this topic. I met with the executive branch team uh, on this, on their report and their analysis and they had filtered out the land through a series of restrictions that they felt was appropriate for solar. And in my opinion, what you ended up with was sort of the equivalent of a series of rooftops, you know, in the farmland, uh, it would be patches. And I don't think that's at all what we want to achieve. We, we need scaled operations, you know, that, that it's easy to implement. And so that, that was there. They, they generally did not endorse the idea that we should produce our own energy as much as we possibly can. You know, Mr. Blockstein's testimony that at T&E on Monday already made that clear. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think we have to produce as much energy locally as we possibly can. And we may not be able to self-produce everything that we consume, but we can do a lot more than we're doing now. Mr. Glass. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so on, on this point of having uh, the 800, approximately 850 recommendations and uh, Chair Hucker and I were, were at that the event where all of that was unveiled, what seems like ages ago. Um, and, and on Monday, the T&E committee did have a very long session, uh, which really only provided a brief overview of those 850 recommendations. But my question is, uh, and I know Ms. Hotchberg is, is uh, here somewhere uh, on the Zoom. My question is, how many of those 850 recommendations have been put into some policy or legislative proposal to move forward? Because it's an important point because people are asking us to wait on that. And so I'd like to get an update on what that is. Sure, uh, thank you, Council Member Glass. Um, so the 850 plus recommendations that, that we received from the work groups have offered a strong starting point for a climate plan. Uh, the county has not accepted or rejected any particular recommendation from the work groups at this stage. Um, the, the recommendations are not yet a final pro work product of the county uh, because the climate planning process is still ongoing. Uh, and we currently have on board uh, a team of consultants um, who are conducting a greenhouse gas reduction impact and co-benefits analysis from each of the prioritized actions. Okay, uh, so so the 850 are, are going to be further distilled uh, right. and then revealed at some point. And you mentioned the consultants, and in this FY21 budget, 
uh, there was more money appropriated for the consultants. And so is that to assume that no recommendations will be put forth until the end of the fiscal year? Um, so the, cons the technical consultant team was paid entirely out of our fiscal year 20 uh, climate change NDA. Uh, and we have uh, some additional uh, initiatives and projects that we have slated for the fiscal year 21 uh, climate NDA funding. Um, so we, we also have developed a, a work plan uh, of about 38 actions uh, that we call our near term climate actions that we have in the works right now uh, while the planning, climate planning process continues. Okay, um, that, that's very helpful uh, as a level set to understand where that work group process is as we continue this conversation. So thank you. Sure. Question, thank you. Okay, please continue, Jeff. We're going, okay. Um, uh, the, another reason to uh, postpone would be to wait for the uh, general plan update that the planning board is doing. It's called Thrive Montgomery 2050. Um, uh, what the planning board and staff has said about that plan is that it would not uh, have detailed land use zoning and other action items, that the plan would only guide future planning efforts. Uh, so if you really waited for that, uh, you would then have to wait for more detailed master plans. Uh, so that sounded to me like a five-year waiting period or something by the time you got to the more specific plans. Um, so uh, that did not seem reasonable in light of, uh, of uh, a desire to help uh, energy goals here, my, in my opinion, anyhow. No, it's not even, it doesn't even change the zoning. It's, uh, it's a... <laughs> Let's, let's say, let's agree to discuss this again in one day strategy. And, okay. Well, and it would, it would actually be three step. You, you would approve the, the Thrive Montgomery. You would then approve the, the future uh, planning efforts that, that more detail it out. And then you would have to change zone. So uh, that's a long time. Uh, that's beyond my retirement. That's uh, Greta Thunberg's granddaughter's time. <laughs> uh, okay, continuing on. Um, uh, the other waiting point was uh, uh, to look at the, the feasible alternatives uh, outside the ag reserve. And on this, uh, I thought, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Hopberg's uh, presentation uh, on behalf of the executive had terrific detail on what that that really means that they they really out they really looked at everything inside the urbanized area and came up with 30,885 acres a possible uh, uh, area and among those possibilities if you if you take the rooftops you have to discount a lot of them because they have uh, other things on on top of the roof. Um, uh, if you take uh, parking lots, there are impediments to that too. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, it's an insufficient amount given given their minimum needs for meeting their goals of about thirty thousand acres. Now there's all sorts of ranges on on their number, but the minimum number was was. 23,000 and then it was 30,000 uh, with some other assumptions at a minimum. Uh, so there's not any chance that 100% of what's available inside the uh, urbanized areas will be used. Just not one iota. And in fact, um, when you, when you think about future development, uh, the executive had, had an opportunity in the uh, building permit uh, regulations to require rooftops being solar ready. Uh, and that's an opportunity that they did not uh, take advantage of because not everybody's going to want to do that. Not everybody's going to want that preparatory expense when they're not getting value for it. So, so there's no question 
uh, in my own mind, that, that you need more than the urbanized area to, to meet any of the council's energy goals. Thank you. I wanted to pause here for a moment. I thought, first of all, your packet was very helpful. So you've, you've identified that it, it looks like maybe 550 acres of non-agricultural reserve land has been take has already taken advantage of the of the allowance for solar panels. So, uh, you know, with all of our decades of uh, legalization, tax incentives, you know, business outreach, homeowner interest, we have we have gotten to where we are, which is not very far. When you think about the scale of, of what we have to do. So at this moment, I wanted to uh, turn to the Sierra Club and ask for some comments here. Um, Al Bartlett and, and Shruti Bhatnagar are here with us today. Shruti is the chair of the county's chapter. Uh, and I want to thank her for being here. I uh, invite her to turn on her camera. I'm going to ask Al Bartlett to share comments about Sierra Club's views on land use and and why this is why they have, uh, you know, what their views are on this critical point about what it's going to take to get solar to scale and, and why we're here. So I imagine they're probably trying to turn on their cameras right now and waiting for, there, okay, there we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Mr. Bartlett, I'd like to uh, invite you to share some uh, I didn't know if Shruti wanted to say anything. Well, let me just say thank you for the opportunity to participate we, um, in this very important and very deep dive discussion that you all are having on behalf of all of us. I actually live in Montgomery County. Um, and so I just to start, let me just say that, that Sierra Club is a conservation organization. So we actually are uh, have common cause with farmers. Uh, we believe strongly in uh sustainable agriculture and good agricultural practices. Um, I personally have great value for the Ag Reserve. At the same time, and this has been something that the Sierra Club, uh, both at the national level and the uh, state level, have worked very hard on, we recognize the urgency of what you all are talking about, that is the need to uh, decarbonize our electricity grid as one of the main sources of carbon and other pollutants. Um, for that we're all living with and it's driving climate change. And so that balance is uh, what we've been working on. So we do absolutely support maximizing all of the feasible and available sites uh, that are possible as quickly as possible. So that includes rooftops and parking lots and brownfields and landfills and so on. Um, but we did when this CTA came to our attention, we were asked to take a look at the, the question, Cosmo and Rima, that you have asked, which is what, how much can we do where? Uh, and to do that, we actually went, we, we didn't make things up. We actually went to uh, best available resources. So the main question is always, why can't we build it all on rooftops? And so we went to the National Renewable Energy Laboratories uh, just a couple of years ago they did LIDAR uh, assessments of uh, uh, states all over the country. And actually, if you look at their LIDAR map of Maryland, they covered a substantial part of uh, Montgomery County and the area between here and Baltimore, uh, a little bit on the Eastern Shore. And so it's very representative. And they came up with uh, a way to estimate how much solar you could put on the rooftops, starting with what's called technical potential. So the the technical potential is if all of the roofs that they found, and this may line up with what um, Adriana's group looked at as well, if everything that you found uh, could be turned into um, solar, how much would it be? So what does Montgomery County need? It needs to meet the Clean Energy Jobs Act total. It needs about 820 megawatts of solar, but at 100%, um, it needs about 2,500 megawatts of solar. And how much of that can be on rooftops? The NREL findings were that the technical potential without actually going up on the roofs was about 2350. But they themselves say that you have to reduce that potential by, if you look at their graphic, it's about 40, about 60%. It's only about 40 to 50% of, we're saying roughly half of that 
technical potential can be realized because when you go up at a roof, there are structural problems, there are obstacles, uh, there may be ownership and legal problems. There are very things that affect that, um, that outcome. And so basically what we can uh, produce on our rooftops of current, uh, both commercial and residential, um, is about 1,175 megawatts. So that's less than half of the 2,500 megawatts that we need at the end. And that's not us. That's uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory way of looking at it. Um, there are some other issues about rooftops as well. You, you can't, it's not economical to put, it's not efficient to put a, a solar array on a rooftop if it's going to have to be replaced in 10 years. Solar arrays last 10 to 25, uh, 20 to 25 years. And so... Um, the time to put solar on a rooftop is when it's either being built or when it's being replaced. Um, and that's going to take, in other words, for solar to actually achieve that full 1,175 megawatt potential is going to take uh, maybe as long as two decades. Uh, and so uh, that's why the urgency that we're all feeling to deal with climate change and green the grid uh, really requires us to do that both and approach we're talking about, which means building um, on the ground as well as building on the roofs as that becomes possible. Um, if you look at parking lots and uh, parking garages and so on, there is potential there. Uh, the limiting factor there tends to be very expensive. Uh, the metro system is just announced they're going to build a, a big parking uh, solar array uh, but they're doing it in the district where the value of the SREX is like $400 per SREX, which is different from the $50 we have here. In our part of the world, uh, parking lot uh, solar is actually quite expensive and uh, not all that practical. And like rooftops, parking lot solar mainly serves the people that um, occupy or own the, own the parking lot or occupy the building. Uh, on a good day, they may put a little extra out of the grid. They get credit for it. They get that credit back. But for the rest of us, we're going to need uh, solar, including solar on the ground. Um, and in terms of some people mentioned commercial industrial land, if you look at the cost of land in Montgomery County, uh, the USDA finds that ag land uh, cost is about $8,000 an acre. Uh, commercial industrial land in Montgomery County is between $100,000 and $1 million an acre. And so uh, those two things are not interchangeable. And for the kind of small budget solar projects that we're talking about, the community solar two megawatt type projects, uh, that kind of cost um, is well beyond what they can afford. So the bottom line is, um, yes, we want to build on all the places that are feasible as fast as are feasible. Um, but it's important. And that time restriction uh, of taking 20 years as it does a rooftop doesn't apply the ground-based solar. So it, that does respond in a way better to the urgency that we have. So let me stop there and, and see if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about. Thank you. Uh, if you could expand on the the SRECs, the SREX, I think that would be helpful. I, I mean, I, I want to say, like, if I thought that putting it on rooftops and, and parking lots would get us a huge increase of energy in the near future, you know, I would be focusing all my effort on how to do that. Um, but I, I think that that is a long-term strategy. And yeah, that, and, and you can't, you still can't meet the capacity requirements as, as um, and even when you max it out, it's only half. It out, it's, only about, it's only about half of what we need. And then that, that, I think the key point there is that, that another half would have to be met through some other solar on the ground, which is farm plant. So it's ultimately a choice of whose farmland, ours or somebody else's. And, you know, that's where I think we really have to grapple with that issue. Why is it, why is it okay for us to say not here, over there? I don't believe in that. That's a philosophy I just don't embrace. Um, okay, so any of my colleagues have to back up to that last point too about, about uh, building up ground there. Now, some of the folks out in the Ag Reserve may be retired people, as I am, um, but some of them are real farmers. And farming these days is a very difficult way to make a living. Um, and if you look at the crop value of 
corn and soy and the other things that are major staple crops here. Um, if you take, if you had 100 acres in corn and soil and you took 10 of those acres and leased them for solar, or, then you would actually make the same amount that you would make for your whole 100 acres of corn and soy, which means you could then take your other 90 acres and do organic farming, sustainable agriculture, something, but you would have a guaranteed income that would let you um, be survive the uh, ups and downs of crop prices and weather problems and so on. So there's, in many states, agriculture is in some cases being, certainly benefiting in some cases being saved uh, by their, their combination with uh, clean renewable energy cycle. Thank you. I, I, I share that view. I think that it applies more to your smaller farmers uh, you know, than your large scale kind of, you know, industrial scale farming. Um, but I think it's a very viable way for, and we've heard from many smaller farmers in the county who would welcome the chance to add a revenue stream that would support their operation. And this is, it is intended as an accessory. So, um, okay, any questions on the, or comments on the core issue of how we would meet our, our, our need for clean and renewable energy locally, whether it's viable to say we can get there with rooftops and parking lots, whether we actually need to open the door to larger de uh, deployment on the ground. Mr. Rice. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I did just want to point out as the district council member that we do have you know other options besides just utilizing farmland. Um, we do have Dickerson Power Plant that's in my district, uh, neighbors, uh, Councilman Friedson's district, and I think there may be a small sliver that actually is a partner's parking lot or something that we share. But um, nonetheless, there are options of large tracts of land where, where we could actually institute solar farms. And so from that perspective, there, it, there are other methodologies that are there. I just don't want to paint it as though this is the only option. There are other ways in which we can do this, and I'm not saying that that's the only way, uh, because I do agree with you that there may be some folks who want to be able to utilize this. I mean, when when I first signed on to this, one of the things I kept exploring was looking at ways in which we could do solar and farming at the same time. And the technology is still evolving, but it's something that shows great promise, um, but it's not completely field tested yet in terms of what it is that we need to do. But I'm really supportive of that notion, which is why I'm, I'm more of just, we need to explore some of those kinds of things and see what it is, because I don't think, I, I'm not one who necessarily wants to sign off on saying, just get rid of the land and just convert it to a solar farm instead of being able to do both. I really feel as though we can do both. Um, and the technology is right there, um, getting close to where we can show that these kinds of things can work to achieve all of those different kinds of things. So I just wanted to put that out there again, because there are other options that are out there as well in terms of how we can do this, fulfill our needs and still, you know, utilize uh, some of the, you know, key tenants that we have as principals in the Ag Reserve. And thank you, since I've invited the Sierra Club, why don't I invite uh, Jeremy Chris? Um, and uh, I don't know if Mike Sheffel wants to join him. Uh, we'll give them a moment to get their cameras online. So um, I, as I said, I'm aware that this is a very difficult issue, you know, and, and farmers have views, strong views here. So um, thank you, Mr. Chris, for being here and please share us. Uh, the voice of, of many in the farming community. Thank you, Hans. Uh, members of the Fed Committee and T&E, &E, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to share the views of the county farmers on solar fields. Uh, Mike Scheffel is uh, with me from the Office of Ag, and we plan to show you some good examples of solar uh, where we've got uh, the 120% rule that's been applied. Um, so we'll need to have Mike uh, share it. Permission to be able to share. Yeah. Can I ask how long your, your presentation is? Because my, it's 10 it's minutes, long. 10 minutes. Can you make it five minutes? I, I'll do my best. Okay. Okay. 
And to be clear, the 120% thing is that today a farmer is allowed to have solar to support their own generate their own use and 20% more use. And so there is some solar installed today. Yep. Yes, and these are examples of how the farmers are actually implementing solar today. Uh, the other thing we'll do once we get through these few examples is we'll talk about some of the larger scale solar fields in other counties that uh, the farmers are uh, fearful of and represents part of the basis for their uh, unanimous opposition to the ZTA. But here we have uh, Rock Hill Orchard. It's also Woodbourne Creamery. Uh, they have both ground mounted solar panels and they also have solar panels that are mounted on the roof of the ag building. And again, this does support uh, all the energy needs on the farm. Uh, the second property we're going to go to is Cherry Glen Goat Farm. It's out in Barnesville. That's a 58 acre farm. It's encumbered by the county AEP program. And so Cherry Glen, <clears throat> uh, they have a milk plant there that they support uh, all the goats. And now you can see the solar uh, panels that are on, on the farm. Uh, the milk plant is just to the left there. So that's another example of 120% on Cherry Glen Goat Farm. Uh, the third property we're going to go to is at uh, Rupert Nurseries and Landscaping. That's in Laytonsville. Uh, so this is a very large scale nursery and landscaping operation. You can see the solar field there. That's just a I was there for the ribbon cutting. That was very. That's a very cool project. So um, all don't, of these. Don't, please don't rush through your points. I'm sorry. You know, take as much time as you need, but. There's, anyway, keep going. Okay, so, uh, so far the fields that we've shown you are ranging anywhere from about one to two acres in size and they work really well. And this is what the farmers have done to embrace uh, the solar fields to help offset the energy needs that they have on the farm. Uh, the fourth example is uh, Bella Vita Farm. Uh, this is owned um, by two sisters from Ohio. Uh, now they have a new aquaponics operation uh, Mike is pointing to the greenhouse right now, and he'll show a trench that's been dug. Unfortunately, this aerial photo was not done. Um, the, the panels are right there at the end of the trench. So they've got uh, the solar panels that are there to help offset the energy needs that are in the greenhouse. So those are the four examples that we wanted to show you why the farmers are actually embracing solar and using the 120% rule uh, to help them. Now this farm here is really important because look to the north here, you're gonna see power transmission line. You'll see the towers real close. Mike, point in, there you go. So there's the towers there. Now Mike, point to the substation that it's connected to. And there's a substation, this is Zion Road. This is the largest substation that we have in the agricultural reserve zone. And so all the tillable ground that Mike's pointing to right now, that's uh, Pleasant Valley Farm, Randy Stabler. And so um, if this, farm would, would be um, used for something larger than 120%. Um, the solar fields would be located in close proximity to uh, the transmission line that feeds right into the, the substation. And so the, the sisters that own this farm, they're interested in, in following this ETA closely. But we wanted to make sure that you understand that if we did put solar panels under the transmission lines. There's been a lot of conversation about that. Um, what I wanna show is the awkward farming situation that that would occur or that would result in. So you've got pasture land to the right. You've got a lot of cows that uh, Randy and his daughters, Kelsey and, Stab and, and Kel Kelsey and Shelby uh, are helping to raise. They've won national awards. And then to the left is the tillable farm ground that Randy and his family produces for the cows and, and other livestock that Hans pointed out earlier. And so if we did have panels underneath the solar, uh, underneath the transmission lines, uh, the insurance companies require that all fields, solar fields have to be fenced. So it would really create challenges for Randy and other farmers that lease underneath of the power lines to be able to get from one side of the transmission line to the other. So I wanna make sure that uh, you saw that visual. Now I wanna just show you a couple examples of large scale solar that the farmers are really, they're challenged with. This is uh, Mount St. Mary's College in Emmitsburg. It's in Frederick County. Uh, this, this particular field is about 75 acres in size. 
the sad thing about it is that all the topsoil was stripped off the property and sold to make money and then they mounted the, the ground mounted solar so when this went in a few years ago it struck a nerve in the farm community in frederick county and the neighboring county so this is one that uh, the farmers are really concerned about in terms of the massive amount of farm ground that uh, the solar could consume <clears throat> second property we're going to look at is in Howard County. This is the Nixon farm. It's just in West Fred West Friendship, which is just uh, south of Interstate 70. Uh, this field's about uh, 25 acres total, but it has really consumed a majority of the farm. Uh, so this was uh, Howard County. Uh, there's, there's a lot of folks in Howard and Montgomery and Frederick that have been looking at this uh, example and concerned about its size. How many, acres, how many acres is that, Jeremy? That one, uh, 25 acres. 25. Now, the last one we're going to go to for is down on the eastern shore at the it's at the border between Queen Anne's County and Talbot County. This is right along US 50, opposite 404. And so this is the Lowen Farms, and this is about an 85-acre solar field on some really good uh, class one, two, and three soil capability classifications, otherwise known as prime and productive soils. That, uh, you know, the farmers, when they see this kind of thing, they're really sad because this is prime and productive farm ground that's gone for as far as they're concerned in their lifetime. And, you know, whether or not we'll ever see a time where these type solar fields come back into agriculture is, is, a, is, a, big, is a big question. So in conclusion, I just want to make sure my job is uh, as your ag guy to make sure you know why the farmers are unanimously opposed to this policy. You know, the legislative intent of the Ag Reserve is for farming, it's for agriculture. Um, the farmers believe that, and they do support solar. That's why I wanted to show you the examples of what they are already doing now. Uh, but the farmers believe that the 1800 acre cap, while it's something that might be here today, there's nothing that you all can do that's going to tie the hands of a future council that would want to revisit this cap and want to expand that cap. Once we establish this precedent, once we allow the Ag Reserve to be used for something other than farming, we may in fact see significant acres lost to farm ground. Now, the Sierra Club representative did a good job explaining the economic reality of farming as compared to the economics of solar. There's no way that farming is going to compare to the economic return that property owners are going to be able to appreciate once the CTA is passed. And a, and a significant amount of the acres in the county are leased acres, which means that the owners of the property may decide to make more money with solar than they're currently making with farming. And so that's going to negatively impact our farmers. So I just, in, in conclusion, I wanted to say that the Office of Ag has worked aggressively with the Climate uh, Change Working Group on Carbon Sequestration. And we have provided and given the data on all the best management practices that have been implemented in the county by the Soil Conservation District. And we have provided the equivalent amount of carbon that's being retained with those best management practices. And I'll challenge anybody to take a look at what that carbon retention has done with the Soil Conservation district in the county and the farmers that cooperate with the district. So I uh, just wanted to make sure you understood what the farm communities use were. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that very much. And I really want to acknowledge our farmers have been leaders in conservation practices. They're farming for decades. Uh, you know, you, you once, uh, I think I once sent you an article about no-till farming and how uh, no-till farming, you know, it was a New York Times story and it was saying many farmers are starting to adopt this practice because it significantly reduces the environmental impact. And your response was that we've been doing that here for 30, 50 40, years. 50, 50 years. 50 years. We started here. Last year we celebrated our 50th anniversary of no-till right. farming right. in Montgomery County. So you know, we've been braver. Our, our farmers are leaders. I appreciate that. All right, we're getting, we have a few council members who have questions. I'm going to see if I can uh, uh, start with Mr. Glass. Actually, I think I only have Mr. Glass so far. So Mr. Glass. Okay. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jeremy, thank you for the presentation, uh, a, a condensed version of it. You and I had a, a presentation uh, earlier this week, I think yesterday, so so I was able to look at everything that you had there um, and and appreciate you revising it or bringing it back up. Um, one of the things that you, you had talked about is, um, you know, setting the precedent if, if this were to move forward. And uh, I would just like a, you know, kind of clarification from Mr. Zions in that uh, I, I think I saw it in the packet, or maybe Jeremy, it was you who mentioned it during our presentation, that there was another county in the state that had allowed this and then decided to roll it back due to the circumstances of the time. And so, uh, because I'm not exactly sure where I recall that information from, it wasn't you, it was you, Jeremy? It is, yes, sir. Okay, so, so what was that situation again? So yesterday we were discussing Frederick County and about 10 minutes before I started my presentation here today, we received another response from Baltimore County. Both of the counties, when they initially adopted a solar policy in their rural and agricultural areas, they saw hundreds of acres that were being applied to property owners for a hundred acres. And it was quite uh, shocking to them. And so in Frederick County and Bradley responded back to us that they put a halt on the applications, that they went back and they revised the ordinance to incorporate the recommendations from the Maryland Farm Bureau. There, the Farm Bureau developed a policy in December of 2019 to help the local Farm Bureau offices to provide guidance on the siting of solar on farmland. And in Frederick County, they now have adopted the policy to restrict the siting of solar fields and solar panels on prime and productive soils. Again, this is USDA soil capability classification, Roman numerals one, two, and three. Uh, this is outlined in our county code chapter 2B that we must follow. And they also in adopted in adopting that revised ordinance, they saw a significant reduction in the number of projects that were actually going to be able to meet that new requirement. So that's what we learned from Frederick County. Today, we learned in Baltimore County that they had more applications in their rural Councilmatic District 3, which is their RC2 zone, Agricultural Conservation Zone. They had 15 projects total that were submitted. They went back and revised their ordinance to not only adopt the Farm Bureau policy on prime productive soils, but they also put a limit on the total number of projects that they would allow in Baltimore County by individual council districts. And so they put that at 10. No more than 10 projects can be approved in any one council district in Baltimore County. So those are the two counties that we've heard from. Uh, so. Well, and, 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 and so, you know, uh, just goes to show that, that I listened intently to everything that you said, and that was uh, probably a sidebar uh, statement, but, but it resonated with me. And so, you know, the, the comments that I think Mr. Rice just made earlier, um, you know, about the Dickerson Power Plant and um, clearly all of these different policy groups that are out there doing their work. Uh, just want to make sure, and, and I'll ask for, for clarification from Mr. Zions, that if this ZTA in whatever form or fashion were to move forward, if um, realities changed or if new information changed, um, dynamics changed, it could be amended to, to suit those needs of that time. Yes, it could be amended either way to make it tighter or looser. Right. The you council has hired me to to respond to changes over time. I write ZTAs all the time. Uh, it, it, it is in the nature of governance that, that we change. The, the other thing I'd, I'd like to say is that no matter what counties are doing in their zoning, they are still preempted uh, by state law on putting in really large facility over two megawatts. Okay. Uh, until you change the state law, that is how the world will work. And if if a really large facility, let's say 85 acres that the uh, that the uh, 
farmers are afraid of, it can go in if it gets a public service commission approval, whether our zoning likes it or not. So we are involved here with facilities that are really under 20 acres at the max. And it's just a different animal than the really megawatt facility. Okay. I appreciate that because clearly we're engaging in this thoughtful conversations and I appreciate the lessons learned from other jurisdictions. And that's what I'm taking from this. And so to know that if anything moves forward, it can certainly be amended. That's an important point because there are a lot of other things up in the air, particularly the Dickerson power plant and how that is reused, transformed, however it might be. I think that is also key. So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do want to say on the Dickerson power plant, I mean, we're talking like an extremely expensive endeavor and it's going to take a really long time. I think we should look at it. I think it might be a great opportunity, but I don't think it is a substitute for what we have before us. It would be an additional important opportunity to help green the grid. And I reached out to DEP and they are talking with the property owner. So I would hope that they will move as quickly as possible. We've got Mr. Juwando. Mr. Hucker, you look like you might want to say something. And then I've got Mr. Friesen. Thank you, Mr. Reamer. Just a couple of questions and comments. And Mr. Chris, thank you for that detailed analysis. Your use of the GIS map was impressive there, whipping around the state. Thanks to Mike. Mike, yes. Even more impressive. He's doing it while you're talking. Farmers use a lot of technology. Hope you don't think otherwise. Yeah, exactly. One of the things you mentioned, I want to echo the Dickerson. I'm glad we're exploring that. I think it is important to, I think oftentimes we can get tunnel vision when we're doing policy and think that, you know, this is the only answer to something or, but really it's one of many answers. So we should explore that for sure. I agree with that. I'm glad Mr. Rice and others have brought that up. The prohibition on the removal of topsoil, well, there isn't a prohibition, but that's something we could add, for example. Correct, Mr. Zients? Well, right now you have minimized grading and soils. It's a minimization right now. If you wanted to make that stronger and say no topsoil could be scraped from the site, you could do that too. But I think it's pretty well covered in the CTA as introduced. Under minimization, do we define that? I can look back. Yeah, maybe look it up. I'm just curious if we define it. Also consistent with the inclusion of pollinator friendly and ruminant friendly. It's a, you know, we're not, we don't want people to scrape the soil. So we want them to continue using the soil and planting it and grazing on it. Right, right. And I know that, that, and I was just, I know Mr. Chris, that is certainly objective. I don't think anyone would want to see that happen if we move forward in any form or fashion. If I may, I did find the line, it's on line 87 of the CTA as introduced. One of the findings on site plan that the planning board would have to do is grading and soil removal will be minimized. To me, I think that covers it. The planning board spends a lot of time paying attention to zoning when it does site plan approval. Thank you. And then as far as the, is Mr. Assant here from DGS? I think, I thought I heard his name. Is he not one of the people that we have? I don't think he was invited, yeah. Okay, okay. The question I had was, was the, as far as the cost of installation for the different types of solar, you know, whether versus rooftop versus ground versus, and I had seen some data that, you know, cost per kilowatt was pretty the same. It averaged between $3.86 to $3.99, depending on the, and I just want to. 
We have representatives from the solar industry. Would you like to direct that to? Yeah, them? That may, yeah. I, whoever can answer that, I just want to confirm because one of the things I had heard anecdotally was that oh, it just costs so much more to to do on you know on rooftops versus ground, and it, the, the data that I saw looks it looks pretty comparable actually. So I just wanted to get a Leslie Elder. Are you there, Aging Leslie Elder? I'm here. Um, I don't actually have the cost per kilowatt, but I'm trying to get that answer for you as we speak. Um, when, I think you that... Introduce, um, yourself. introduce yourself, please, Les. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Leslie Elder. I'm the Mid-Atlantic Director for the Coalition for Community Solar Access. And um, what we are is we are a national trade association representing um, developers and, and businesses along the line that, that primarily focus on, on community solar. Um, so we are the, the bucket that fits under the two megawatts. Um, and I think the one thing that's interesting about us is that we are not the large scale utility um, facilities that you see and think of when you think of landscapes that are being um, uh, just kind of covered by, by solar facilities, we're much smaller. Um, so to, to address your question directly, one of the challenges that you have, and, and I want to be careful on this because we also um, highly support building uh, facilities on rooftops and do that as well. And so we, we strongly believe that you should do this in conjunction with. Um, but there are uh, significant challenges that can come along with doing rooftops um, that can increase the price uh, significantly. And a lot of that has to do with the structure of the roof, uh, the ownership of that as well. Um, and so it is going to be important to really consider doing a uh, yes and approach uh, when it comes to trying to meet your your goals in Montgomery County and also in, in Maryland um, and ground mounted projects and on land and agricultural land as well is the most cost effective way in order to be able to achieve those goals. Uh, as soon as I get an actual answer from one of my membership companies on your uh, on your question, I will give that to you. Awesome. Thank you. You've been, yep. you, you did it. That was great uh, filling the time and your dog popped in during. The, um, <laughs> I, I had seen some studies uh, to s suggest that it was much more expensive to do rooftop than to do ground mounted, but, and I can get you that study. Okay. Yeah. And I, and again, we, the, I mentioned Greg Assant because we, I, I, we had inquired about this point and got some uh, figures from him that, did not suggest that. So I just, that's something we don't have to get it right now, but I'm just curious. To, I want that information. The last thing I'd like to say, and uh, Mr. Chris bring, brought this up, uh, which was very concerning. And, and one of the concerns I have as well, as far as the amount of uh, leased land in our agricultural reserve, and, and, the, and I don't know if you gave a percentage, but the, the idea that many of our farmers are leasing the land from other owners and that if it became more uh, advantageous to use the land for a different purpose, i.e. solar, that you could have a mass exodus. And, and I know that's one of the concerns of the farming community. Uh, could you could you talk about that? Maybe start with Mr. Chris and if there's any anyone else that could address that concern. And, and as far as I don't have any guardrails, potentially, I know there's a maximum acreage cap but that could be something that we could look at potentially too with that would occur to me would, would be a maximum amount percentage of the property itself that we could. And I think that's one of the amendments. So if you could just, Mr. Chris, maybe talk to about the percentage of the, any comments you have on that point in particular. Sure. So in the agricultural reserve, uh, we have over 90,000 acres that was stated earlier. We have currently 65,000 acres in farms as defined by the USDA agricultural census. That's broken down into a variety of different types of farming, but when it comes to the farms that are in corn, wheat, and soybeans that are owned by people that lease the farms, it's over half. Over half of the total number of acres that we have in the county that are in corn, wheat, and soybeans are owned by folks that lease their farms to the farmers. Now the lease agreement ranges anywhere between $70 per acre up to perhaps as high as $130 an acre. And 
The reason that there's such a range is that if we have farms that are really on the prime and productive soils, the yields are much higher. And so those farmers share a portion of the crop with the owners of the property, which is why they pay higher amount per acre to lease those soils, those farms with the best soils in them. And so this is the primary concern that we have within the ag community because there, as I said, the farming economics is not going to compare to the economics of generating solar energy. And then when the farmers realize the threat of losing farmland, then they say, well, what was the agricultural reserve created for in the first place? Was it created for agriculture? That's what we've been told for 40 years. Now, it looks like perhaps that's not going to be the case moving forward. And so I just thank you for asking me this question because it does provide an opportunity to really drill down on why the farmers are unanimously opposed to this. So hopefully so half, half, half of the five over, over VA is over half is leased. That's what I was trying to get over at. Half. And the cost was helpful too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I acknowledge we hope that 1800 acres will be used. That is the goal of this is for 1800 acres to be used. And Mr. Chris is basically saying he's worried, you know, will be used. I acknowledge that that 1800 acres is a big change from how it is presently being used. And, you know, that has consequences. I, I understand that. I also think not doing this has a different set of consequences. So, um, I understand it's not that's why this is difficult but it's i just don't want to i don't want anyone to think that i am not aware of that i i am aware of that i, I understand that this has real consequences for people who lease land who farm lease land who are involved in the supply chain of farming lease land you know it's not just the farmer it's the grain store it's the tractor sales it's all of that you know so it's it's real um and i just i think we need to acknowledge that and i do um and I think that if it wasn't for the crisis that we are in on climate, which also affects agriculture, which also affects the children and the grandchildren of everyone who's in farm, you know, we wouldn't want to have to make a choice like this. So appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Jawanda, we, my staff has shared with yours the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory studies on the cost differential. So uh, that information is definitely available and you can make sure that for the next discussion, uh, you've got that. Thank you. All right. Uh, I think back to our queue here, Mr. Kenny. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, you're not queue. You're. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Tucker's queue. <laughs> Me? I think you're next, but I don't know. Actually, sorry. I, I didn't mean to. Okay, Mr. Friedson is next. Then. I, I, was, well, I think I was uh, vigorously nodding. Um, exactly. It makes me look smart whenever Jeff Zions makes a good point. Um, <laughs> And one is that um, I just agree that that the um, like like everything else, we're under constraints imposed by the state, and the 2.0 megawatt limit in the state, which is in the original ZTA and then this one, um, was not put in place uh, out of any any anyone's uh, uh, argument that it was somehow in the public interest. It was just at the behest of utility lobbyists. Not all states have those kind of limits. Some states have no limits at all. Um, it was there because powerful industry lobbyists from utility companies asked for it. Um, so, you know, if if uh, uh, if the state allowed us to build larger facilities in areas where there's sort of no conflict and no trade-off, we'd be in a different position. But they don't. So that that's another reason why we're here, and people should just keep that in mind. Thank you, Jeff. Mr. Fritz. Yeah, you know, I appreciate this. First of all, with the Dickerson Power Plant, I it's in my district, as uh, Council Member Rice uh, has uh, noted, there is work underway. DEP is doing some work uh, underway on there, and I am working uh, closely with Delegate David Fraser Hidalgo, who lives close by, and I know uh, I know Council Member Hucker also has been in conversations with uh, Delegate Fraser Hidalgo, and uh, there is uh, work underway. I think it's going to require a Herculean effort from the state with some county support. Um, but, uh, you know, that's an area where we're going to have to make a significant investment. 
Uh, but I do think that we need to be careful about this conversation. And I think there's some real serious questions uh, of public policy of the agricultural reserve, but I don't think it's particularly productive or frankly, particularly relevant uh, for us to have the comparative question of how to generate solar or what's a better place to generate alternative energy, whether it should be on a rooftop or whether it should be uh, on the ground, what's worse, what's better, how it works. I, I don't think that's the public policy question that's before us. And uh, we certainly could do uh, something and, 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 and should pursue something. And I think it would send a powerful message to turn a coal power plant into one of the leading uh, solar generation plants uh, on the East Coast, if not in the country. And the message that that would be sending from Montgomery County would be heard around the world uh, in terms of our commitment. But I think it has nothing to do with this conversation personally. I think this conversation, and I have not decided what I'm going to do on this public policy, but what I am weighing is not whether or not a rooftop is the right place to place a solar panel or whether the Dickerson uh, power plant is a good place to put solar, which it is if we can make it work. It's the question of what is the appropriate use for the agricultural reserve? And what are the consequences for decisions that are made with changes to the allowable uses within the agricultural reserve? And if we pursue policies that change uses within the agricultural reserve, what impact does that have on agriculture in Montgomery County and on the farmers who make agriculture possible? That's what we should be focusing on here. There are serious weighty questions relating to those issues. And I just, hope that we can focus on the issue before us and not get lost and caught up on identifying parking lots in Montgomery County or school sites or other uh, places where it might be possible to generate uh, alternative energy. I don't think that it will help us, or at least me, make a decision of whether or not the policy that's before us is an appropriate determination for what is and should be done in the Agricultural Reserve, if it's consistent with the intent of the Agricultural Reserve and uh, how the uh, impacts uh, and consequences will be uh, both on the long term of the Agricultural Reserve and on the farmers today and into the future. That is the question uh, before us. And I'll just uh, close and I just think, you know, add to the conversation, part of that to me is the 1800 acres as has been described, but also the question of what does this mean moving forward? It, you know, uh, as we heard earlier, by definition, a zoning text amendment, amendment means change, can be changed at any time. We are changing what the zoning code is uh, as part of this uh, public policy proposal uh, that's before us. And I think we need to ask the question uh, and, and, and raise the issue and, and, and uh, you know, figure out, you know, whether or not there are long-term uh, consequences. There are concerns, I think, you know, reasonable concerns that we need to address of slippery slope and of what this means for the agricultural reserve. And I think we need to confront them and we need to address them and we need to decide the appropriateness based on the answers to those questions. I just wanted to raise that issue. I think that we should stick to the issue before us. And I just wanted to thank again, uh, Mr. Chris uh, and, and, and the ag community for uh, presenting here. I think you've added a lot to this conversation. I appreciate the chairs allowing me an uh, opportunity for you to share your very important perspective because I don't think we should be having any conversation about the agricultural reserve and what the uses of the agricultural reserve are uh, without the participation and active involvement of the farmers in the ag community. So thank you. Amen to that. All right, so let's continue through the packet. Uh, in time check, it's 3.30. Uh, I, I certainly think we ought to hard stop at 4.30. Um, so uh, why don't we work, keep keep going, uh, Mr. Zines? Okay, you're, you're past my time for my Revenue Authority facility inspection. So uh, I can go as long as you'd like. Um, in any event, um, that was golf. That's that a flip book, Chuck, right there. I, I, I got it. Okay, that's good. Um, uh, let's see, uh, I, I, there's been enough said about urgency, uh, and after I go through uh, the adopted master plans stuff, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Single for, for a little bit. 
but but uh, there was a, a a claim that that this ETA would be counter to the the general plan and the agricultural uh, the preservation of agricultural and open space plan. Uh, generally, we allow the the planning board to tell us if they think there's a uh, inconsistency with those plans. It, it's one of those findings they have to make when they have site plan in, in, in any event. Uh, in this case, their, their recommendation was, was to approve with amendments. They didn't find any uh, conflict or direct conflict with, with the general plan and agricultural preservation plan. And all of those plans that I detail in the memo indicate that there's going to be some other uses allowed in the ag reserve. Uh, you know, uh, for example, right now we, we allow agricultural processing uh, f from the site. We allow things related to agricultural tourism that aren't directly agricultural it itself. Um, uh, certainly, I didn't find uh, that there, there was this kind of a conflict that was irrefutable. And in fact, uh, you know, Jeremy said that half the land is rented. Uh, that means half the land is owned. And, and to the extent that the owner gets a supplement uh, from uh, solar rental, uh, it makes it more viable for him to continue the, the risk of agricultural on the rest of the site. Uh, so we didn't hear from a lot of property owners. We, we heard from a lot of uh, renters in testimony, but certainly from the standpoint of an income source for an owner farmer, uh, there's some benefit here. Uh, continuing on, yes. Um, uh, can solar panels be integrated into agriculture? And for again, I, for then for this, I'd like to turn it over to Miss uh, Single. Everyone. Um, like Jeff said, my name is Mira. I'm one of the County Council Summer Fellows and um, in, listed in the appendix is actually a list of agrivoltaic projects, um, some that are in Maryland, some that are all over the United States and, and research has been done on these projects. And they found that it, you can um, successfully integrate solar into agriculture, agriculture and then it's beneficial both for the plants and the farmers. Um, I will say it's not an exhaustive list. Each of these projects is unique, um, kind of just like the agricultural reserve zone. Um, understanding that this is actually a really great opportunity to be innovative, to come up with practical solutions and understand that this isn't just some kind of broad general cookie cutter answer for what we're looking to do um, to create cleaner energy in the county. Um, I just wanted to clarify though, that I think when we bring up the idea of solar and agriculture, we immediately think of those large um, solar farms that Mr. Chris was talking about, and I think that's a valid point, and it's something that we should be concerned about. Um, but rather that the ZTA focuses less on large-scale solar and more on integrating agriculture with solar, not solar into agriculture, and that the primary um, benefit and use will still be agriculture at the end of the day, and um, ensuring it's based on state law, like um, Jeff had mentioned with the maximum of two megawatts, that land would still be holding an agricultural use. Um, so I know the pollinator friendly designation was mentioned before that's been updated on the Maryland website. Um, anything from grazing like we had seen in some of the projects listed before crop production or some form of agrivoltaic use. Uh, Council member Rice, you mentioned about the possibilities of potential markets to integrate solar. So I read some great um, research about how creating honey now um, that's all been based on solar power and how that's become a really great market and you can not only market your locally created honey, but that it was made through solar panel and that there's all these opportunities that the Ag Reserve could really partake in um, during public testimony and mentioned earlier by Mr. Chris, um, there is concern about harming the soil and wanting to protect the top soil. And I think that's something that needs to be addressed. And other farmers have also expressed that same concern. Um, there was a study done in Massachusetts by a farmer who was also concerned about losing that valuable soil and when he chose to integrate solar into his agriculture, um, he did it without um, using concrete, without using harmful materials. And he has the ability to then return the land to its original condition and to help preserve it, um, as well as create the crops that he had previously um, produced. So I think that there's a way that we can do this with limited disruption of the soil 
And generally speaking, this is something that's possible um, for the agricultural reserve zone. So um, again, some listed in the appendix and um, I'll turn it back over to Jeff. Thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation. Welcome. Okay, uh, now we're getting into uh, amendments, uh, some of which were suggested, some of which are an outcome of uh, what was in testimony. And, and the first we've talked about a little bit before is, is keeping the solar production local, if you will. Uh, and that's to restrict it to uh, the, the programs with, within the net metering allowances within the state of Maryland. Uh, community solar is one piece of that. That's where um, uh, communities contract. Uh, Jeff, I just want to clarify. We are going to ask questions about these amendments. We're not voting on any amendments. So right. you're going to walk through the rest of the packet, which outlines some of the amendments that people have suggested. There will be no motions. Uh, this is just a chance if anybody wants to ask a question about any of these. And particularly if, uh, if, if people want, if, uh, uh, you know, I have a whole weekend for homework to do homework here. So if you have things that you want me to do, uh, you know, please speak up so that I can be prepared for the, for the next meeting. Otherwise you, you are going to get, see all of this material in number five again. Uh, as it's written, but I just, ju I was thinking that you wanted the heads up on this. I think it would be helpful personally, just to go through this. People can ask a question, you know, we will. So anyway, that was my thought. It'd be useful to get through this. It's not that much actually, and it'd be nice to get all the way through this packet. That'll, I think that'll clarify what we'll be doing next, next time. And, and to, to address the concern of whether this should be local and whether it comports with Maryland's allowance for net metering, uh, it's easy to uh, uh, amend the ZTA to do that. Uh, it's citing the particular, particular section of, uh, of Maryland code that allows it. And Maryland, well, Maryland code refers to a, a future uh, regulation that's also addressed. Uh, I see that I, I think I have an error in this. It's really, uh, it ne would need to be compliant both with the section of uh, Maryland Utilities article, article and the Comar section. The Comar section is written uh, to um, implement that the uh, uh, section of the Maryland could, of a public utilities article. It's not one or the other. One is implementing the other. So I think that would be an and. But but that is an easy amendment if people want to do it. It sounds like you may, but we'll wait for another time. So it just is there an uh, interesting... so Jeff, sorry. Uh, please give me a chance to interject in case there's a question for clarification. So this, there, it's possible to have an amendment that would basically uh, ensure that all or most of the power, is it all or is it most, would be consumed in the county? It, uh, to the extent that the power companies have jurisdictions outside of Montgomery County, uh, it can go outside the county to Frederick. Um, it, I, it's, I want to state that I, I think our objective here is to green the grid. You know, I don't know that it's to only green the grid for people who live in Montgomery County. Uh, I think it's to green the grid, but if it didn't harm our effort, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to this. So this one is on the table here. We'll keep, we'll keep going. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I thought the, the, the worst thing that could happen is we could provide clean energy for Virginia. All right. You, you know, but uh, in, in any event, we can keep it in Maryland uh, to the extent of our uh, three suppliers. Um, you know, a little bit of the Ag Reserve is, is PEPCO, and a lot of it is Potomac Edison. Potomac Edison certainly reaches to other counties, but, but that's pretty local, I think. Um, uh, fences are an interesting issue. Uh, uh, some people did, did not want uh, a fence requirement. Fences certainly are 
an impediment to uh, travel from one side of a field to another for sure. Uh, fences, we'll say in a second, are required as, as some, some of the screening requirements. But you were asked whether you should prohibit fences or not. So you'll have to make that determination. Question? Can I jump in? Yeah. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we just jump in here? This is a, yeah, exactly. So, so talking about fences, well, actually, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the localized power aspects um, first. Uh, what is the feasibility to, to make such a mandate that the uh, power generated stay within whatever jurisdiction, whatever geographic area we desire? I, don't, I really don't think you can. Uh, it, it's something controlled really by the uh, Public Service Commission. Um, uh, I, I think uh, controlling it within the power companies themselves is as good as you get. Okay. Okay, um, and then moving on to fences, uh, where did, what was the, the origin for, for that idea? Was it a safeguard or something else? Um, I, 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 now you're asking me to read the mind of testimony, which um, I don't have that license, but um, one, it might be visual. Number two, it might be physical. Um, People may not like the look, or they may not like, again, being able to um, not go through the field of solar panels and have to go around it. Okay, well, and, and yes, it is, it is hard to do mind reading mon months after. Um, there are people who charge good money to try and figure that one out. But um, I, I think it's an important point to try and understand as to whether or not there was a practical effect to having the fence or whether it was uh, a visual uh, effect to, to streamline. So um, that's where my thought is on fences one way or the other. There's a very practical aspect to it that I'm told by some industry people in that uh, they can't get insurance if they don't have a fence. Well, uh, so Okay, so so then that so that's actually dictated by insurance and outside control, correct? So it doesn't matter what what would be in the ZTA, they would need to do that to comply. If if that is the correct rationale, they would need to do that to comply with their own insurance provider. Well, uh, they would be concerned if you prohibited the fence, uh, and some there was testimony that wanted you to prohibit it. Okay, okay, then. That's an important distinction. And the planning board said, don't require them. Right, don't require. Got it. You, you may not require it, but then they might want to put it in anyhow for insurance. Sure. Well, right. And if outside control dictates for their own economy or you know, economic situation that it's needed, I, I understand that and wouldn't want to inhibit them from being able to conduct the other businesses that they, that they have. Okay. I'm good, thank you. There is a practical issue here, which is if we are, for example, trying to allow, I don't know, grazing, maybe a fence isn't practical in that instance. And so we wouldn't want to make them do that when they actually want to do something different. So, anyway, Andrew. Yeah, without devolving into prior conversations, uh, council members Reamer and Juwando and I have had extensive conversations about uh, the practicality of requiring or not requiring. I was getting a flashback though. We, we spent many hours uh, on this very question. And you know, I will just say it is challenging in land use and zoning text to deal with fences because every circumstance is quite different. And every fence actually is quite uh, uh, different. So I just, I wanted to raise that, that we have uh, a lot of the background. Hole. Don't go yeah, down a lot of background on this particular issue, but it's something for us to weigh. I don't want to weigh it here, but I think it is an interesting, uh, you know, an interesting issue that I'm glad we are, uh, we're, we're thinking through. Well, I wanted to bring back, because I think Mr. Glass raised the important point that I'm still trying to work through. You know, my understanding has always been that, you know, electricity is based on electrons. Electrons go into a transmission. The transmission then gets, you know, uh, sold off the, 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 the grid that, uh, the, the electrical grid does not uh, 
distinguish or differentiate between a Montgomery County household and a Frederick County household and a Carroll County household and a Northern Virginia household, you know, it, it, so can we just explain, I mean, it, it seemed to me that it was kind of simplified in the way that Mr. Zients raised that. I have my understanding of this and I recognize I'm an expert in nothing. And I'm certainly not an expert in the electrical grid, um, but could, could we explain that because it, it seemed more simple than from what I have understood it as in talking to some of the folks who uh, have reached out about this uh, particular issue that it would not be a practical uh, prohibition uh, potentially based on how the actual industry works and the transmission of electrons on electrical grid works. So I don't know if Stan Edwards can speak to this. Yeah, if, if I could help with community solar. So I'm Stan Edwards from the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, community solar is uh, governed by state law. And the key element here is the net metering that we've talked about. And under state law, uh, a, a community solar installation, the, the subscribers to a community solar installation must be within the service territory of the utility where the installation is located. So a community solar installation in PEPCO territory, the only subscribers that can net meter on that are in PEPCO service territory. In Potomac Edison, the only subscribers have to be in Potomac Edison. So you, you depending on where the facility is built, that's where you can have subscribers to the community solar system. So that it stays on the same grid from the same company, but it's it, it's not. Well, it, it does all go into the grid. The net meter is, a, is an accounting transaction. Right. You're not, you're not getting those electrons from that facility. It's so what you're saying is effectively there's something in place. It might not be specific to Montgomery County per se, but it is specific to the region, you know, because it's the service area of the utility company, which is localized. It is localized. It's not confined to Montgomery County. It's not so confined to Montgomery County, but it's local. It's regional. It's yes. within a confined area. I mean, my understanding is community solar projects right now, we have Montgomery County residents, I believe, in my district that are purchasing from Prince George's County, from Fort Washington, from a community solar project. Now they're purchasing it off the grid. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. I understand it. Freedom line, Mr. Andrew. I'm no, please, please. I'm, I, I, I'm right. trying to learn a little bit more yeah, about me too. Me it. Too. The way it was described earlier did not seem to reflect what Mr. Edwards is right. saying, that I we could restrict it. it. For instance, yeah. you can't restrict it to county is what I said. And I what I said was, was that it relates to the service area that that it's it comes from but the, so I the, thought the goal of the state net metering policy i'm in i'm interpreting here is to kind of limit the deployment of these facilities by making the companies match the production with actual customers in that service area so it, it, it it's putting a constraint on how that business will be conducted the actual electrons yeah they flow into the grid and it could be wherever that grid is connected i suppose so there is a state policy that ensures that community solar will be used and consumed by the same provider. Is that the right word, Stan? No, within, the same, within the same service territory. Service, area. service territory. So PEPCO serves a lot of Montgomery County, a lot of Prince George's County, and the District of Columbia. So and that's our nation. We're on that grid. That's what, that's the service area we're in. And that's we the service area we're, we're most of the counties in. The, the county actually has three utilities. Potomac, Edison, Pepco, and BG&E serves part of the county. And so that we cannot chop it any more finely than that. Right. We cannot dictate that the power from a community solar in Montgomery County be purchased by only by a Montgomery County resident. So just to summarize, so I understand, since we're talking about the implications of what has been suggested or presented, we can exactly mirror and reflect what the state requires, which is the same service territory and whether we include it in there or we don't include it in there that would be the requirement because it's required by state law right I, I, but we I couldn't from a practical standpoint based on the way that electricity works which unfortunately we don't have control over we could not restrict it to montgomery county is that, I, mean, I just want to make sure that we're discussing this issue within the realm of how the world is operating right now Right. The county, the county would not be able to put a law in place that superseded the state law, which governs community solar. So, yes, so we can include, we can, we can just reflect the same state law in our law if we want to, just to have belts and suspenders. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change anything, but it would, 
It would just add what is already existing in state law, or we could do nothing, and it, the state law would still be the law of the land because we happen to be in the state of Maryland, which has yeah. law. Yes. Well, to that point, if we tried to put in a restriction that said it can only be in the same service area, and then if the states somehow changed theirs and said, I don't know, that the, it could be different, then we would no longer have a viable, I mean, I think it would sort of be preempted. Uh, but the basic point, I think, is that it's already taken care of by state law, that community solar is already fits under a parameter that keeps it as local as we can possibly make it. The only thing I would say is uh, the ZTA as introduced does not require that it be in the net metering program. So that in theory, not in practicality, in theory, you can uh, add uh, energy to the grid and not be in that program. Now, you, your returns would be selling um, uh, at wholesale energy prices. But the theory is you could do that. So you're saying, if you so confine that, it to saying, the metering program, yes, you, you are then w within those bounds of the state law program. So you're saying a person could take 10 acres and sell at wholesale to EPCO, but why would they do that when they can sell essentially at retail under the community solar program? There would be literally no reason whatsoever. To well, at some point, uh, the state might the power companies in the state of Maryland might be over the allowed acreage for um, net metering. Uh, net metering is confined to 1,500 megawatts within the state. If it goes over that amount, it's not part of the net metering program, but it's not prohibited uh, for you to have a contract with the power company to put in power. So that, that's why I'm saying you you are better off, I, I think, confining it to the uh, net metering program within the state, and then all of those other things that Mr. Edwards went through apply. Good. Keep moving. Okay. Good to see you, Stan. Uh, you can, thanks. Thank glad you're here. Okay. We're ready to move on a little bit. I think so. All right, we went through fencing a, a little bit. Um, and, and part of uh, fencing is required um, in, in screening under the planning board's uh, regulations. Um, what we said in the, in the ZTA as introduced is that particular type of screening was required uh, when it was, um, Let's see. Uh, when it was visible from a residential use or a road, uh, and the the screening required was that, that it have a 30 foot planting area and a six foot fence. That's the screening requirement itself. The planning board said, "Gee, why don't you make um, the the screening uh, optional for us to waive in case?" The existing vegetation uh, is better off than, than the planting that would be required or that there were particular circumstances uh, uh, that, that it was just better to waive the requirement. Um, You're saying the zoning as drafted, it requires a screening? As drafted, it requires screening if you are uh, visible from a residential use or a road. That is correct. And the planning board is saying, let us handle that. Give us discretion. We'll get a better outcome without a requirement. Uh, right. Uh, the, and the only thing there is whatever you decide on fences should apply here as well, because part of that screening required is a six foot fence. So you just have to connect the two issues. Okay. Uh, we went through planting under solar. Uh, we, we went through the, um, the, the fact that we wanted to be pollinary friendly. We want it 
or as an alternative to be able to have animals graze under it. By the way, the best animal to graze under is sheep, that I'm told. They don't eat everything in the world like a goat does. But sheep have been shown to uh, coexist well with, with solar panels. But in, in addition to that, of course, you can have things that are more um, um, uh, table crops uh, if you had the labor to, to produce that. In any event, the, the, there was a recommendation and testimony to broaden the list of, uh, of uh, plants that be, could, could be grown uh, including what we call agro-paid plant material. As drafted, it basically would limit it to pollinator-friendly plantings, which doesn't allow you to do KO, and that's basically what you're saying. So we would and, need... And, uh, and grazing. Uh, right, grazing. Okay, that makes sense. I get it. I understand. Okay. Keep going. Um, we got some... Um, testimony specifically from the Rustic Roads uh, Committee, that advisory committee that wanted um, their input to anything within a quarter mile of a rustic road. Um, Tom, you're going to have to repeat that. I, couldn't, I, mean, I was just wondering if it was chaired by uh, Dr. Orland. <laughs> well, was it? No, sorry, ignore me. <laughs> Okay, so the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee is asking that all land within the quarter miles of a rustic road should not be allowed, essentially? No, they just, they all they said was at least they should have a, a shot at, at, at that, that the CTA should require their comment before the planning board could approve a site plan. Um, free to comment? At any planning board proceeding, they are, um, and and really in site plan, there's already a necessary finding that in approving a site plan that it's compatible with existing and approved and pending adjacent development. So if existing and approved development is the farm and the road, um, I would think that they they have some obligation to uh, look at that issue anyhow. But we did get the comment. To that point, does the designation of the rustic road, it's a formal designation that would qualify under that requirement? Uh, well, there, there is a formal designation procedure for rustic roads. No, I, I, I know that. I'm saying because there is a formal designation of a rustic road, you're saying that it would qualify under the existing requirements to require them to weigh those issues as part of the formal planning processes in my opinion yes you can there are planning board members here uh, that can answer that as well um, if you want Rob, Robert Cronenberg uh, to answer that or Rich Weaver to answer that they're available yeah it would be helpful just to confirm that which would address the issue without needing to address the issue, I would think. Mr. Weaver, are you there? There you are. Or, hey, let's go back to the original question and pose it again. Um, the, the question is, uh, should, should there be um, specific commentary on, on the scenic easements for rustic roads? Um, to be honest with you, Jeff, that was the original comment from staff to the board. Um, what was the Rustic Road functional master plan includes scenic vistas that are to be given, I would call it additional scrutiny when a development application comes in. Um, and that somehow has morphed and now into any project within a quarter mile of a rustic road. I can tell you when a project abuts a rustic road or has frontage or access to a rustic road, it is automatically sent to the rustic road advisory committee. So um, it'd be uh, a bit different yeah. if it was just within a quarter mile. But we can we can try to make that happen. It sure would be nice uh, if it was in the the code that it would be a requirement to send it out to the rustic road uh, uh, committee. 
But again, what we intended was the, the rustic road functional plan has identified scenic vistas that, again, are, are to be given additional scrutiny for the protection. Again, in the placement of residential homes, for the most part, in the uh, ag reserve. Um, and that's uh, that was where we had come down initially. So it's required if it's abutting. It's not currently required if it's within a quarter mile. And because it's a formal designation and the book shed is part of the planning designation, that's part of the consideration right. from planning. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rich, if you have any suggested language that you would want, uh, uh, why don't you get it to me as soon as you can? I want to be very. I, I want to say I am very concerned about this, right? I mean, I don't think that solar is incompatible with the the, the view shed. I mean, I think it's just another future on the landscape. Uh, you know, if we start saying that scenic views, I mean, you say that solar is incompatible with the scenic view. You know, I don't know where that takes us. I mean, if you go up right. on top of Sugarloaf Mountain, you know, should you not be able to see any solar from the top uh, of Sugarloaf Mountain? And, and I didn't intend to raise the need for an amendment here. I was trying to get clarification on what the existing rules are as they, you know, as the current planning process is, as mentioned by Mr. Zions. I just want to understood. I understood. I just didn't want. To, I didn't want to imply that I was saying let's go down that road that rustic road <laughs> uh, so uh, well, we, we so uh, we got some information here council members can follow up as they see fit on this point if they if they wants to propose something that will be up to them okay any more questions on this one otherwise we'll keep going Okay. Um, the, the, the next issue is, is one, of course, we've talked a, a little bit about is, uh, uh, is, is the uh, economic impact to, uh, 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 to rental farming and making sure that farming is, is still uh, a significant use uh, going on, even even on these sites. Um, uh, I mean, these sites uh, f uh, for less than two megawatts of uh, solar would be at a maximum of about 20 acres. Uh, 10 to 20 acres is a is a good number for for this stuff. Um, uh, so. Um, the average size farm, uh, uh, Jeremy tells me, is, is something over uh, 110 acres. Um, if, if you wanted to do something uh, that made sure there was farming on the individual site, you can, you can if you want to, do something like uh, uh, Frederick County did uh, and have a percentage maximum of solar on any individual site. Um, uh, it, it's just uh, a, a matter of how much you are concerned about individual parcels and what happens there. Right now, if you had something uh, as proposed, uh, if you had a site that was uh, less than 20 acres, it could all be sold. Um, and it's just whether you wanted to uh, pro prohibit that kind of opportunity or, or, or do something else. So that's something you'll have to decide next week. Yep. Thank you. I mean, I want to say from my perspective, we drafted this with the total acreage cap uh, and rather than laying in all kinds of different caps, we thought put a total cap on the acreage and, you know, that will that addresses the overall need. So, um, okay. Thanks. All right. I, I mentioned this before on facilities larger than two megawatts. Um, we have nothing, we, the county, has nothing to say about these facilities. Uh, right now in the code, 
we, we say that large facilities need to be treated like public utilities within the uh, current zoning code. Uh, the ZTA, as introduced, changes that to acknowledge the, the reality that we've been preempted by the Public Service Commission. Um, what was suggested in testimony is public, uh, public Service Commission, even though they don't have to abide by local law, they, they need uh, to consider uh, local zoning law. So for that reason, we, we should change um, uh, what was proposed in, in the code. Okay. Sorry, are you on G? I'm, I'm on G, yes. Okay. I was listening to you as though you were describing F. Uh, I wasn't quite sure how those things fit together. Okay, so um, can you restate? I, 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 I get it. We're not allowing facilities larger than two megawatts. That's the core of this whole. But restate that for. All right. Uh, again, what we have in the code right now is something that deals with uh, facilities that are larger than two megawatts that says we just treat that as if it were a, a public utility. Um, but in fact, the PSC uh, has, can preempt us and just blow away our zoning. What, what was proposed in the ZTA was acknowledging the reality that we're preempted uh, versus keeping that requirement that it satisfy the public utility requirements. I see. So we don't have to defend something in court that we know we have no ability to defend. Well, it's not that we have to defend it. At least it will give the Public Service Commission something to look at as to how we would handle it within the county. Uh, so there is some advantage to just leaving something that the PSC must consider. Okay. Got it. Okay. Sorry to be, if I was confusing anyone. All right. The hour is getting late. That's all. Well, we're, we're almost through here. Uh, the, the, um, we got lots of testimony on various prohibitions of, of what areas, uh, uh, of differentiated areas. You've already heard about uh, prime soils. Um, uh, there's, a, let, me, let me look up that number again. I think it's 32,000 acres of prime soil. Yeah, 32,327 acres are, um, are prime and productive soils. Category um, one, two, and three. Say again? If you put together categories one, two, and three. Yes. Yeah. Category one is just 2,000 or something. Uh, relatively small. Um, um, can I just, I think uh, this is a really important issue. I think uh, having the ag community here just explaining you know, I've learned a lot about the prime and productive soils and some of the challenges. I kind of came into this early on thinking that it would be very easy to figure out, um, you know, one, two, three versus four and five. And, uh, what, you know, and, and I've come to learn from both the industry and from the farmers that it's not such a simple uh, issue. I think it's been, uh, you know, kind of simplified in, 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 in how we understand it. So is it possible to just get a quick explanation of what that means? I think I think I, def I gave you the definitions of what those soil types are. Yeah, I, I understand for like from an academic standpoint, and I appreciate that, Mr. Zions, that um, we have that in the packet. What I'm, what I have learned over the course of looking into this is that it's not so simple as just determining based on that definition. Uh, of what this actually looks like. It looks like Council Member Glass wants to weigh in, so I'll, I'll yield. Well, so, so what I'm going to say is this. Um, I, I agree with you that this, this is going to start getting complicated now. 
Um, and I've been asking for pieces of information, and I know that uh, there are different types of um, maps and analyses that are out there, and we're going to have to sort through all of that. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to suggest to the chair who already referenced the time that we might want to put a pause on this right now and pick this up at the next session. Otherwise, we risk stopping midstream. Yeah, I mean, this is this is probably one of the major issues that we will be discussing. Uh, so, you know, I think we could maybe just get a quick, quick highlight from Jeremy and then we'll we'll probably going to call it a day. Uh, so go ahead, Jeremy. OK, so as your ag guy, we have Agronomy 101. And agronomy consists of how the soils were evaluated. And this dates back to the 30s, when the Conservation Corps first was established under FDR following the Dust Bowl days. They came up with a USDA soil taxonomy code classification system to look at the different types of attributes and limitations of the soils. Chapter 2B of our county code outlines what the requirements are for our farmland preservation programs in accordance with state code requirements. So for the purposes of what I have always done in my career here in Montgomery County, I have always used USDA soil capability classifications, Roman numeral one and two, which are equivalent to prime soils and Roman numeral three for productive soils. Again, if you want to look at what I just said, it's in chapter two B of the county code. And it's the requirements for our farmland preservation programs in accordance with state code. Now, separate and aside from what I just discussed, there is another type of system. And I believe Park and Planning used the prime soils analysis, which is different than the USDA soil capability classification system. So that's why there's a difference in the acres that Jeff just cited versus what my understanding is of the class one, two, and three soils in Montgomery County. The total amount of acres of class one, two, and three soils in Montgomery County is 53,307 acres. Again, that's the total of class one, two, and three, which is different than what Park and Planning came up, which was 32,327 acres of prime soils. Well, you, uh, well, I, just a second. Uh, what I what I only say is that whatever legislatively you want to use is what we will use, uh, but it will not be something that's a debatable issue. It will be on a map that's agreed upon if you want to go in this direction at all. Sure. Yeah, I agree, and I just you want to raise. I, mean, I I I think it's important that when we go into the next conversation that we have. The relevant maps and we're all reading off the same song sheet you know i i agree with council Member Boss that right now is not the time to flesh that out it's why i'm so appreciative that we're doing multiple sessions just to uh you know as a start uh you know to get through this um but i do think this is a very key issue and it's very clear that people are talking about different things and using different classifications these have major ramifications for the viability of solar if we move forward for the economics for farmers uh, either way and so i think we need to be very thoughtful and I, as transparent as possible with the public to share the maps that we're basing these off of the actual land that we're uh, talking about so that we can make the best public policy decisions but also do it as transparently and accountably as possible so that, that's my only point here i appreciate that yeah okay so you know i think what we will really be doing next time as we talk about this issue is if there is a council member who intends to propose something, you know, then that will become the basis of the discussion. Um, you know, we, we, we could just have a general educational session about prime soils next time. Uh, but I think it would be probably more 
effective use of our time, you know, for council members to drill down into that issue or dig into it as it may be and figure out what they want to, you know, what, what they think. Um, so, uh, having said that, um, what else is in the packet, Jeff? Well, uh, aside, aside from these geographies is, is just the, the issue on, uh, uh, the accessory use of uh, uh, of electricity right now or on-site stuff uh, right now we say as an accessory use not as a limited use you could have a facility that provides 120 percent of your on-site usage the the net metering program actually allows up to uh, 200 percent of that use and you had some testimony that suggested you might want to allow the 200% as an accessory use, which means that area would not go for site plan approval. Okay, so that is a possibility is to expand that 120 to 200, which would allow a property owner to, you know, increase their own small desk deployment and then. Okay, so next time, Hey, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah. So I just had a real quick question about uh, in terms of due dates for some of these ideas. So if we want to flush out some of these things, and I know I'm not on uh, both joint committees, so I want to, you know, be respectful of the joint committees and their work. But from that perspective, um, is there a deadline as to when you want those? Are you accepting those from, you know, because I'm a co-sponsor, I would hope that yeah. I would be able to just submit something. Let's, so let's talk about the calendar here. So Jeff, when is the next meeting? The next meeting is exactly one week from today, the 16th. Okay, so, you know, the ideal is council members who want to propose an amendment will have that drafted and in the packet. So that would be a Thursday noon deadline. Uh, is that right? My packet is due <laughs> Monday. Monday. So Monday. Your okay. packet is due Monday. So, so if you've got it in your back pocket, and you, you need people, it now for Monday. If people don't <laughs> feel that they are close enough I'll to pull it out of my inside jacket pocket, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, you have to go, uh, you know, harvest some ideas. Uh, right. Okay. If people don't feel that they're ready for that, you know, we'll follow up here we'll, with with each of you individually. You know, if people don't feel that they're ready for that, yeah, and, and, yeah, and the you can. Um, it's kind of behind the, the rock. We can uh, <laughs> we, we can talk about how to how to proceed. Um, you know, I think the best thing to do is for each of you, if you haven't already, to have that presentation. You know, from planning staff and or, or Jeremy, you know, yourselves, so that you can ask all the questions, and then at session we can have a dialogue that is you know, based on your having had the chance to get all that kind of stuff beforehand. Um, but it sounds to me like some of my colleagues may not be, I mean, I certainly think I know what I want the final version of this to look like. So I'm, I'm prepared to make recommendations to my colleagues as to what amendments I like and want to support, you know, it, so I hope that others are close to being able to do that. Um, We'll just have to. We'll just have to talk, Mr. Chair. I think the the aspect for me is given the tight turnaround uh, on issues that we haven't dug into to continue those bad puns. Um, that's that's the concern I have because there's that level of education that I still have to have those conversations, which I haven't fully had yet. I've had a lot, uh, but the details of those maps and if we're not going to have that conversation here, I need to well, set aside that time. I mean, I, again, I think the best case scenario is we are looking at those maps within the context of someone's actual proposal. Um, well, so, but, but I don't know what I want to propose without without having those those in depth conversations about topics I know I need to have conversations about. I mean, we we, we know we're talking about these tiered soils, uh, and I haven't gotten a full debrief specifically on those tiered soils, and I haven't. Uh, last I had a conversation um, just yesterday, and I've told that there's two different analyses regard 
different soil types. One is with DEP and the executive, and then one is with park and planning. And at this point, I, I don't know how to reconcile that because I haven't seen either of those maps. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, all I would say is you'll need, you'll want to know, you'll want to have that reconciled for yourself before the start of that next committee meeting or else the next committee meeting, it'll be hard to. Sure. And, and, vote. and, and the plan is, you know, my, my hope is that we are voting next time. Uh, so, so uh, yes, I, I, I respect that request. Absolutely. And I can meet that obligation, but the catch therein is having those amendments ready before Monday or so. Yeah, that's a tight timeline. Can I just get clarity on that? I think there's a couple of things that uh, I think prime soils is an example, and I think agricultural easements is another example of you know what is allowed and what uh, isn't allowed. Um, uh, you know, it sounds like there's two ideas here, both of which you've raised, Mr. Chair. One is to have a presentation on those, you know, for for council members to ask questions in a more public forum. The other is for any council member who wishes to propose an amendment based on that to pick USDA, you know, you know what uh, the Ag Office uses or what Park and Planning uses, determine that, get the map, have it ready to be presented, and use that as the basis of a discussion in the context of an amendment, or to have an educational, you know, kind of broader uh, context. And I just want to get clarity on how we're moving forward with that. And then you know, I would say the same thing with easements. Uh, you know, if there's any relationship uh, uh, to the impact on existing ag easements, we have county easements, we have state easements, we have private uh, easements. There, there are uh, some implications on that. I think there may be some, uh, you know, thoughts on you know, making sure that that's flushed out a little bit in the context of uh, this proposal. And I think the question would be whether there is an amendment that's put forward, and then we have uh, a, a detailed, in-depth discussion based on. The amendment of what the implications of that would be and what the different policy areas are or whether there's a you know a broader kind of educational q a for council members to be able to ask as part of the work session i just wanted to i think those are two big ones for me i mean i think offense we don't need to have an educational conversation i think that's a discussion that we can have and it's a choice but um, i think those are you know kind of technical educational uh, issues that either could be done broadly or in the context of an amendment, both of which you raised. And I just want to make sure we all have a clear understanding of how it's going to proceed for next Thursday. All right. Um, Jeff, you haven't really talked about the easements issue. Uh, no, I, the, the, there are really two types of easements out there, uh, or, or three if you go to private. Um, one are paid for ad, ag easements, uh, the state program and the AEP program and uh, those would not allow um, solar on them even if you allowed it. Uh, so that's sort of self-implemented. Uh, the other thing, if you wanted to go much broader on a form of easements are TDR easements. That is something that the executive uh, seemed to have uh, excluded from uh, uh, the availability of uh, solar to get down to uh, 900 acres. Uh, 900, but, 900 not very helpful acres, yes. But, but those are the types of easements. Within TDRs, there's uh, uh, the building lot termination uh, easements as well, which, are, uh, which uh, don't allow houses, but they are a form of TDR. So it just, depends on uh, whether you want to restrict more than what is restricted by law anyhow now. Okay. All right, so uh, again, I will say, I think the best course of action is that we are discussing soil issues because there is a concrete proposal that is on the table, either to use them or not to use them. Um, and that that is how the conversation is driving. If we are going into this with a very open-ended, let's understand the issue, I wouldn't want to have to be in the position of getting up to speed on it and then making a decision at that same time. So I think we should go through it in order, I think we should bring up the maps 
in order to, as Andrew said, have transparency about what we are deliberating on. But uh, I really think it would be ideal for committee members to, you know, have a general sense going into next week's discussion of what they think about that issue. And then we can bring transparency to that discussion at the committee. But if it's purely an educational sen session, I think it would be hard, you know, for me as a council member, it would be hard to have to cast a vote in the same time as I'm really planning to learn about something. So the expectation, just to be clear, the expectation is that there will be proposals or a, a proposal or multiple proposals. There could be multiple council members that have a different idea of how to differentiate prime soil, for instance. You know, there's one, there's one, two, three, there's one and two, there's USDA. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to skin this cat, um, but that we, we discuss this in the context of one or more proposals, either comparatively of these are what the different proposals would look like, and this is what it means, or individually, but in some context thereof. Correct. And I think the distinction is your expectation as a committee member is you're going to have to make a decision at that time. And, and so, you, you know, you don't want to walk into that not prepared, right? So, well, there's one thing I'm not concerned about is walking yeah. into uh, the beginning, not being prepared. <laughs> I will certainly be prepared. I just want to make sure that I understand the expectations so that I can prepare and that I pre prepare accordingly for what that conversation is going to look like, what the decision points uh, are going to be, and I will uh, continue to do the work necessary to be ready for next week. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and this is a joint committee, so it is a little harder to schedule, um, but, uh, you know, because there's many more council members that we have to line up. Um, so we have next week scheduled, and we were, not, we were not anticipating that we would need an additional joint committee session. I don't think we do, uh, but, you know, I don't want to make it uncomfortable for anybody either. So, um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll talk to you and we'll figure out where people are at. All right. And, and I may not be able to answer all questions, but certainly I'll have a GIS folk uh, up and ready. And as, you know, to, to Evan's point, I mean, there are multiple maps showing multiple different decisions about what land could be available or, or how. Um, so, you know. Could, uh, could we just ask, is there, would there be an issue? We, we, you know, there's, there's two different maps. I mean, one thing is to choose what you pick off the map. The other is to pick the map itself, you know, which is a pretty fundamental question. Is there an issue? I mean, obviously, whatever we put in, we need to make sure everybody understands. We need to be looking at the same map that needs to be included as part of the public record uh, for posterity if we move forward uh, with this proposal and if we move forward with an amendment like that in this proposal. But is there a practical issue with using something differently than what Park and Planning uses if that's the agency that's going to be determining the approvals? They, they so will like use, USDA is not approving where a solar, if, if this were to move forward, USDA is not going to decide the site plan. And so, you know, I think on the one hand, if the farmers use USDA and we're talking about farmers, I'm, you know, I kind of like the idea of using what the farmers use, so that they understand what they can and can't do on their property, because that's what we're talking about. This is the agricultural reserve. On the other hand, if there is a body that is approving this, that uses one type of map and we're legislating on a different type of map, will that create any issue? I think that's an important philosophical or practical question, actually, to ask you know, as we move forward, because I know a lot of people are thinking about this soil question. That's an interesting question. They, they, will, they will get the layer that you wish to regulate on. So I believe both of those uh, criteria exist as GIS layers so that it's knowable and discernible and you don't have to go uh, hunting around. So, so uh, Rick, as long as we use Rich has hopped on and he's representing park and planning here on these issues, there's no reason why the park and planning would have a problem implementing a map determination, I see Robert Cronenberg too, uh, based off of a USDA map that is can be GIS map versus 
whatever it is the map that you all have historically used or have been using. Is that yes, no, kind of, maybe, not sure? Well, let, let me clarify. When the, the, the prime soils that were promoted by park and planning were, in fact, the, off the prime soil list from the 1984 USDA soil survey for Montgomery County. When we look at development in the AR zone, we ask that uh, residential development try to be located away or off of prime ag soils. And it is my belief that that is the list that a developer would go to to uh, make that determination on what the use of that or what the uh, agricultural uh, uh, benefit of that soil is. I, I don't want to... It, all claim to be an expert on soil capabilities and agricultural uses. Jeremy Chris can should make that call. He's much more knowledgeable about what is considered prime and what types of soils uh, are, are best suited for agricultural uses, depending whether it's livestock or pasture or crops. So, um, yeah, I'm we, less asking for, I'm sorry, I'm less asking for your expertise here on what is prime and what isn't prime. I'm more asking for what level of flexibility the planning department would have to make consistent and uh, you know determinations based off of any map you know the map that jeremy is talking about which obviously is different than the map that you are using yeah and, and if the answer is that would cause a huge problem that's something that we ought to know before we propose or vote on these questions if it's not a problem and you say hey whatever you decide as long as there's a gis map that can be layered on top of you know whatever we're looking at it's no problem we can handle it then that's a very different i just want to confirm that because you know forget about voting on it as we're crafting and thinking through amendments that is a very relevant to decide what map we're even basing this off of and what acreage we would even be talking about and i think just to answer that question maybe a little bit uh, more bluntly we can we can work off whatever map that both our office and Jeremy Chris uh, you know feel is appropriate and we can have that as a layer and that's the basis for moving forward um, so I think we're comfortable with producing a map with Jeremy's assistance on that um, and we can come to some conclusion on what's the what's the right layer what's the right map to use so that you have that information in front of you can you do that, uh, you know, please, as soon as you can, and then council members can ask to see the implications in both? Sure. We can start by sending the map over to Jeremy that we use that was sent to Jeff as well, I believe, and uh, just uh, we can have that conversation with Jeremy. Sure. Okay. And I'll follow up individually as well prior to the next meeting. Thank you. Okay. All right. Good discussion. I think it is 429. Uh, thank you so much. Um, appreciate everyone's participation. Thanks to everybody uh, watching at home. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care, everybody. Everybody. Information Center at 240-777-7433. One half of normal service. MCDOT also has implemented a procedural change for riders boarding buses during the emergency. Passengers are now required to board